Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with four or fewer people. The HR platform will provide you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Le Levi Valage Reed. Levi, you ready to be great today? Me? Levi graduated from Wells Co College in upstate New York, near the, near the dairy farm where he grew up. Grew up. Sorry about that. Both of his parents were small business owners and had a strong interest in entrepreneurship. After working in the wine industry in New York for a couple of years and then in government, he studied for his MS in communications at Ithaca College and started a marketing practice. That got him interested in startups and tech, and ultimately he decided to do an MBA at ESAID in Barcelona, where he was first entered to land an internship with Amazon in Luxembourg. Levi, I think you for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jason. Thanks for the invitation. So, did you grow up on a dairy farm or just close by a dairy farm? On a dairy farm, about a uh, hundred head, um, for the most part, hundred to one hundred and fifty. So, uh, were you considered like a dairy farmer, a farmer, regular farmer? Like, how's that work? Dairy farmer, yeah. So, it's my dad's farm. Um, if I'd gone into farming, I'd be the seventh generation in the area going into dairy farming. Oh wow, that's that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, the family's been up there for a while. There's there's roads named after branches of the family in the area. Cornell University has a farm named after the family because they bought it from my great grandfather. So yeah. Hey Levi, could put just a little bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Let's go. Cool. The mic. No, just the chair itself, so you they can see you. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I need to do a better setup. So, what, what's the daily life of a farmer like? When did you start farming? Were you like? Three years old and the dad kicked you out hey get up before in the morning to go milk some cows well that's that's pretty traditional in farm families but uh in my case it was a little different dad uh dad wasn't super enthusiastic about the farming business and he was pretty dead set against uh myself or my brother going into agriculture um so you know we played on the farm we learned our way around machinery how not to hurt ourselves that sort of thing from an early age but uh, i actually had to argue with him in my teens to, to get him to let me help out on the farm and start milking cows and operating some of the machinery and whatnot so a little bit of a different upbringing, I suppose. Is the farm still in the family? It is, yeah. It's not a dairy farm anymore. It's a sort of active retirement. Dad went into uh, feed cattle farming. Although, as of last update, he has yet to actually sell a cow for beef. And last I heard, he was naming one, which is never a good sign. So we'll see. No, <laughs> it's kind of hard to eat something you have a name for, right? This is this is true. And we're, the rest of the family is starting to question if, if Dad's really intending to actually sell any of these cows or if he really just likes keeping cows. How, how many cows are on the farm? Right now, I want to say it's in the neighborhood of 40 or so head. Yeah, um, so you can have 40 personal pets. <laughs> something along those lines, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, we'll see. So what are some lessons you learned from being on the farm that, you know, other people might not have by, you know, growing up in an urban environment? Well, I mean, there's certainly a comfort in a, in a very different sort of environment, right? Um, it's always been sort of surprising to me, I think. I think a lot of people who aren't really exposed to, to the natural world, a lot of children can be very scared of it. Um, and for me, it's, it's sort of the opposite. City city environments have always been sort of thrilling and, and a little scary, but usually in a good way to me. And, and I, I kind of feel a lot more relaxed in the middle of a field. <laughs> um, that and just kind of learning how to, how to work around big animals, I think is probably a pretty important takeaway. But I mean, in more applicable senses, I think the thing about farming is, especially a small farm where, you know, it might just be one farmer or one or two people. Um, you know, there's a lot of animals depending on you, right? So I would see my dad get up and he, he could have a full-on influenza and he was going to be out there feeding the cows and he's going to be milking the cows because if you don't milk the cows regularly, they, they develop diseases. Um, and that level of grit and persistence, I think, is, is something that really uh, instilled a, a certain type of work ethic in myself and my brother from a young age. So not many sick days on the farm, I'm guessing, unless you're like on your deathbed, right? Pretty much, yeah. Either that or if you've got a hired hand, but dad was the kind of guy who never really trusted anybody else with his cows. So it was typically just him. I, I remember one time he uh, had a pretty catastrophic accident, dislocated his shoulder and, and broke some collarbones. And so I was maybe 14 or 15 at the time and I was helping him with milking. And uh, after, after a few weeks, he just stopped telling me when he was doing the milking because he'd go out and do it himself, one arm up in a sling. And I'd, I'd, I'd go, Hey, where's dad? You know, and somebody, Oh, he started the milking. I go running out there 20 minutes late to help him out. Cause he just, he didn't want to ask for help, you know? Um, 
but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of persistence there. So I could be wrong, but like most of, most of big farms, they make a lot of money, but like small farmers, they're pretty much like living paycheck to paycheck, right? Taking exactly, out loans right. and like, then it's a real struggle for them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big part of why dad got out. It's, it's difficult, right? Cause you, you look at it on paper and the assets of the farm can easily be seven, maybe even eight figures, even for a relatively small family farm, especially if land value goes up. But you know, that's also the business. And in terms of day to day, you know, even a small farm like ours grossed six figures. And that was back in, you know, maybe the late nineties or early two thousands, but um, nearly all, or sometimes more than all of that goes back into operational costs, you know, for feed, livestock, maintenance, et cetera. Um, so yeah, very capital intensive business, typically not terribly profitable. And unfortunately the, the trend seems to be increasing in that way. It's, it's really favoring massive operations and aggregation. And I have to imagine like the insurance cost has to be astronomical on our farm. I would think about the heavy machinery and other working stuff. I can't imagine what, that, what it is. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the motivations I think that makes it really challenging to bring um, employees on board, right? The, you'll notice if, if you go through economic data or, or um, you know, labor regulations, OSHA regulations, a lot of these different policies apply to everything except agricultural workers. Agricultural workers are exempt from a whole lot of things, including a lot of different um, uh, minimum, um, minimum wage requirements. Um, so yeah, it can get really quite complex. And unfortunately, a lot of those exemptions open the door for a lot of labor abuses in the industry. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a very difficult situation. So next, talk about your time in Barcelona. You spent a year there, right? Just talk about the experience, you know, how you liked it, didn't like it, and just what you gained from being overseas. Yeah, absolutely. About two years there, actually, um, for the program. But uh, I mean, it was my first time really living abroad. I've traveled abroad before did a backpacking trip to Europe for a couple months after college, which was a lot of fun, but, um, you know, I'd been based in the same hometown my whole life. And so I was just kind of, you know, reading the writing on the wall and looking at trends in, in the kinds of roles that I wanted to go into and, and seeing that international experience just seemed to be something that was really important. Um, I'd had an international focus in my undergraduate degree as well. Um, and, you know, like a good MPA student, I uh, put together a spreadsheet. I had my, my hard requirements and my must-haves and my nice-to-haves for each MBA program I was looking at. Um, ultimately ended up applying to a few all through Western Europe. Um, so I just decided that was, that was kind of the area I wanted to go for, right? It was an international experience, but given that I'd never lived abroad before, I didn't want to do anything too alien, too different, um, you know, ease myself into it. So I ended up with Asade in Barcelona just because it um, really ticked all the boxes. It was a long enough program to enable an internship. It, uh, offers really, really strong exposure in terms of entrepreneurship. They've got an incubator, literally a startup incubator in the same building as the MBA program. Um, and that really paid off for me. I got an internship with one of the startups there two months after landing on campus. Um, and then I was really fortunate as well because I, I had a, a really good family friend who was living in Barcelona. She's, she's from there originally. So I was able to kind of break out of the school bubble a little bit and actually experience the city. Um, I made it a personal goal to really improve my Spanish. I'm of Puerto Rican descent, but I was raised in the U.S., so my Spanish is pretty rocky. Um, at this point, I'm not sure if it's better. I've got I've got some from Costa Rica because I studied there. I've got a bit of an accent from Puerto Rico because my family, and now uh, apparently some Catalan inflections. I'm told so, <laughs> people people native speakers look at me now when I speak Spanish. They give me this confused look, and invariably they go, "Are you Brazilian?" <laughs> um, but no, it was it was really a wonderful experience uh, overall. I mean. I completely fell in love with Barcelona. I fully intend to move back at some point. Um, I, I just, I love the people there. I like the pace of life. Uh, only really real downside is the salary. Um, but the, the experience of total immersion in, a, in another culture is, is, is incredible. And it gives you, a, I think, a, a new dimension um, of empathy, right? When you're, when you're working with others or talking with others just to understand the ways in which societies can be different, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, not even necessarily unique to people from that area. Yeah. I think so many Americans miss out on the travel thing. Like I, I have friends back in Texas, they, they go the next and over. It's like travel, like doing, doing a big trip. Right. And just the culture of different places, how people do different things and see different things. I think a lot of Americans miss out. I, I think that's probably true to be honest. Um, you know, I, one of the really interesting experiences for me, to be honest, coming back, from living in Europe, because uh, I, I was in Spain and then for my internship, I also spent several months in, in Luxembourg. Um, coming back was just having a new perspective on the differences between you know, different cultures within this country, right? Um, I mean, the US is, is a, by global standards, is a, is a fairly large country, both geographically and in terms of population. Um, 
and the, the level of, of diversity that we have just in terms of sort of cultural heritage throughout the country is can be really profound. Um, you can see it linguistically, right? In different dialects throughout the country with dialectical uh, uh, differences in language. Um, and uh, I think it was, you know, before, before traveling, I would kind of have an attitude like, uh, I don't think I fully appreciated the, the, the extent of those differences and how, how uh, meaningful it can be to try and understand those different patterns between, you know, cultures within the same country. It, it definitely gives you a different perspective. Yeah, I think we, we don't realize how diverse you are in America, right? If you go to Germany, everyone's a German. You go to France, everyone's a Frenchman, right? It's like, yeah. it's different. You know, I, I think I could make this up. Like, I think there's a neighborhood in Queens, New York was like six, like 200 languages, 300 people from different I, countries. Yeah, it's, it's wild. And it's, you know, Europeans get very confused when, when you talk about, you know, why are all Americans identifying something else? You know, you always say you're German. You're not German, you're American. I think, yeah, that's understandable. But the thing is, I think you have to understand the difference between a nationality and you know the, the state to which you belong, right? And in, in Germany, you are your your German ethnicity, your German eth and nationality, assuming you know your your family is of German ethnicity. But um, but you're also from the German state. And in, in the U.S., there isn't really you know an American ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. We we don't have a single American culture. We we have a culture that's built up out of amalgamations of the people who have immigrated here for the most part, right? Obviously, you know we have native populations as well, but that's I think for the average individual, probably not a major part of their cultural experience in this country. Um, and uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that distinction is, is maybe maybe lost on some folks. And that's why, in my opinion, so many Americans will identify something else because they're looking for a cultural identifier as well, right? In addition to their, their point of origin in their state. And I, I think that's why we have so many, what do they call them, uh, hyphenated Americans? I think is the term. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's so a funny story, and this is kind of my, it might be borderline inappropriate, but it's kind of funny. I remember a caveat, when this happened, I was like 19 years old and single, right? So I'm in the army in Germany, and we took this mean, and they had a trip to go to Barcelona, Spain for like a week, right? So like 20 of us went, right? 20 guys went, right? We're walking around, and this female walker still, female walks up, like really pretty. Hey, do you want to have a good time and party? Like, yeah, sure we do. How many are there? She's like, well, there's 20 of us. Well, there's only 10 of us, but we can make it work, you know? How much money you got? And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> you're talking about that kind of business and we just like ran away right <laughs> that's why well i didn't have any experiences like that in barcelona myself fortunately but that's that's pretty funny um yeah I, I think you know you do have to watch out for things like like uh it's it's pretty common in uh in a lot of major cities through europe you know there's there's some pretty creative approaches to uh panhandling and yes you know, soliciting money um and we stick out like a source of some 20 young american guys with army haircuts you know and you just yeah. You could just tell we're like right for getting scammed and conned out of stuff, you know. I had a, an experience, uh, I guess, a little bit like that in, in Paris. I was was there for a, a school thing, and I had the rest of the day, and then I had a, a flight back at the end of the day, so I was having to carry my little wheelie bag suitcase around with me, and that made me marked for, for everybody. And so at the time, there was this scam that a lot of the folks were running there, where they would they'd come up to you with a clip clipboard, they pretend to be deaf and mute, and the clipboard was trying to solicit like donations for some imaginary, you know, deaf mute society. So this happened to me a couple of times. I waved them off. And then at one point, this woman approaches, same exact clipboard. They were clearly coming from the same source. And this, uh, this street vendor nearby starts yelling in heavily accented English. She goes, hey, it's a scam. Don't, don't pay any attention to her. So she whips around and glares daggers at him. So clearly not as, not as deaf as she was uh, trying, to, trying to claim. And then uh, she puts the clipboard towards me and I, I waved her off, you know, because I already knew it was a scam. And, uh, and the, guy, the guy starts yelling something in French. She turns around, starts yelling at him in French. <laughs> And then in English, he goes, eh, fuck you. <laughs> I, I could not stop laughing. Not 10 minutes later, I'm walking down the street. I pass a group of teens. They're all chattering, talking amongst themselves right in front of me. And then one of them kind of breaks off from the group, lingers for a moment as I walk by and comes up to me with the same damn clipboard. I, I looked at her and I said, no. And she, she gave me this look and shrugged like, well, worth a try. And then, and then yeah. ran off to get every joint. At friend. least they were persistent. They were persistent. All right. Yeah. But. The, the ones I encountered in Spain, to be honest with you, were probably worse. There's a, there's a tendency there where um, someone will run up to you, they'll grab your hand and they'll put something in your hand, you know, small fake flower or something, or they'll pretend to read your palm or whatever. And then they'll start screaming at you, demanding money, right? So you really have to be quick on the draw. If somebody grabs your hand, you got to whip it back as fast as possible, put your hands in the air. Um, otherwise, it, it creates quite a scene, which is, is pretty unpleasant. Yeah, we were in Italy for two years when I was in the Army with my family. Mm -hmm. And like the, I don't know if it's the correct term or not, like the gypsies were there mm -hmm. and man, they were like aggressive. Like you'd be at the stoplight, they'll come knocking your window, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. Like give me some money, right? And they will bring the whole family, right? 
Wow. And they were really, really bad. So in Italy, they passed a law, I don't know why, where like somebody broke in your house, you can only like defend yourself, you felt threatened. Okay. So Gypsy starts sending their infant, like their small children to rob your house, right? Holy cow. Like six, seven year old kids, right? And like, wow. and like, are you gonna like beat them up and like shoot them? Like, no, cause then you're going to jail, right? <laughs> so they were very, very smart on how they did things. Wow, that's wild. I mean, I think regardless of the legality, I, I don't think uh, I want to want to do much to harm a child anyway. Even though yeah, that's exactly. But that's uh, that's pretty intense. I, I hadn't heard about that. The the only encounter I think the the term they use now is Roma. Um, yeah, they say Roma. That's the, it, Roma. That's the correct term. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I think I encountered a few Roma. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I I think in in Barcelona in particular, and to some extent in France, but definitely in Italy as well. But Nothing like that. I mean, definitely some persistence in panhandling. But that was Do you have a favorite country while you was over there? Oh, gosh. I mean, honest. Well, OK. So, all, all, all the other above. <laughs> <laughs> depends on the mood I'm in. I, Catalonia in Spain is is probably, if, if I had to pick one place I was going to spend a lot of time, that, that would probably be it. Um, but uh, because to be honest with you, the, the north of Spain and Catalonia in particular is is so dramatically different from the south of Spain. So I couldn't, I couldn't pick Spain in general. But, uh, outside of that, I think uh, Italian food is, in my opinion, really, really good. Like Central and Southern Italian food is some of the best cuisine on the planet. Um, I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> yeah. It's, I've, I've been getting into bread making over the past few years. And uh, like about five years ago, I started. And some of those Italian hard breads are some of my favorite things to make. Yeah. Like I said, we're eating for two years. And like, we never had a bad meal, right? Yeah. It was like at one time a friend recommended me, hey, go to this, this pizza place. It's like 30 miles away where we lived at. Yeah. And he said, this one is gonna it's gonna kind of downtrodden and kind of bad, but man, you gotta stay for the food. We went there. It was like 90 degrees in the summer, there's no air conditioner, <laughs> everyone's sweating, there's flies everywhere. But it took us like an hour to get in, right? Yeah. So that's a clue is good. We got the pizza, like, man, it was so good. Like we forgot about th the the flies, the heat. It, yeah. it, was, it was so yeah. good, right? That that sounds about right. My my brother and I spent some time in few days in Rome and uh, I remember at one point we got a we got a pizza we walk into this little pizza joint on the corner fully a third of the interior space is just the oven yes hardly any other space sweltering in there because this was in the middle of the summer in Rome and same as you were saying air conditioning and I think and this was just a few years ago it was maybe I think it was about five euros we got an entire pizza that sounds right pizza and uh we both ate some from it like full meal had some more that evening and had it for breakfast the next day. It was, I said, oh my gosh, I think I love Italy. <laughs> yes. And the wine too, Italian wine is. is just, a, just a house wine, they give a meal, some random house wine they make in the back, in the backyard or somewhere. It's like, just great. You know, Croatia is like that too. Mm -hmm. the, the food in Croatia is very cheap, unbelievably good. And the same with the wine. I remember going to, 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 to markets in Croatia and buying uh, what I think was Zinfandel. Um, in in literally a, a two liter like plastic coke bottle for like two three euros and drinking that and it's just incredible i mean it's not an it's not a wine you'd age and it wasn't aged wine it was it was you know much a much younger wine but just really really good really fantastic you know and you're buying a sketchy looking plastic bottle it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic and it's dirt cheap honestly spain is still like that like you, you get you get i i went to restaurants personally i've got photos of venues where a glass of wine is cheaper than a bottle of water and yes. you get the wine and it, you know, it's, it's nothing you're going to write home about, but it's, it's very nice wine, right? It's, it's not bad at all. No, no, um, it's not. And I say this as a former winemaker. <laughs> and another thing about when he was in Germany, like one time my daughter, I think she was in junior high, she had to do a, a book report on Anne Frank. What we you know we do that weekend? We drove to Amsterdam with the Anne Frank house, right? Really? Yeah. I was in Amsterdam. I couldn't muster up the nerve <laughs> to, to visit the house. Anymore. Yeah, that's wild. So it's just great to like, do opportunities. So next, Levi, talk about how you got involved with tech and startups, how that transition happened. Yeah, that's a that's a long story, honestly, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Tell me if I need to fast forward. Um, so I uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning, like you said, uh, I, I did a master's degree at Ithaca College um, in communications, and uh, it was really more in kind of the theory and science of communication, I'd say. And a lot of folks from the degree went into, well, into HR, actually, was a really popular um, destination. It wasn't really a marketing degree, but that's kind of how I decided to take it. <laughs> um, and so after I left my, my job with government was trying to kind of stand on my own two feet as, as, a, as a consultant or a freelancer, freelancer slash consultant, um, I had a really lovely design agency I'd, I'd done my internship with in Ithaca. Um, and they were, they were just massively supportive. Um, they didn't really do content development, um, but they did a lot of web development and graphic design. 
So I started working with them to kind of as a subcontractor, essentially work with their clients. And I got myself an office in a small co-working space in downtown in that city. And this co-working space was mostly it was some startups, some freelancers, and the group, two or three, I think, I think two, two partners behind the co-working space were working on an, a startup agency idea at the time. And so I got involved in that as, as kind of a part-time thing and ended up you know, providing some services to some of the other folks working in the co-working space. And I just started to really fall in love with this. Like, it's, I saw another founder say this on LinkedIn, and I wish I could credit who said it because I can't remember now, but they were talking about the idea of launching a new initiative as making business into almost a form of art or self-expression. And I thought that was such a great way of putting it, right? It was, it was such a fascinating exposure to, to, to realize that you know, th these kinds of initiatives that even the biggest companies in the world, in many cases, they were started by someone going, you know, it would be a good idea. And then just doubling down on that, right? That there's, there's so much uh, self-direction and opportunity um, in the space if you want to take advantage of it. And that, that level of uh, independence, autonomy, and creativity to me is just intoxicating. Um, so I really loved that work, but I, I came to realize I was just butting up against a wall. I just did not have the knowledge, the business expertise, the experience to feel that I was set up for success in the space. So that's what led me to do the MBA. Um, and like I said earlier, I, I chose that MBA specifically because of the, um, the, the entrepreneurial focus of the program. It really is very strong. I, I, uh, looking back, I think I made an even better decision than I realized at the time, to be honest. So I, I came out of there and, and I knew at that point that I, I really wanted some larger company experience if I could land it, um, not least to replenish my finances after two years living abroad as a student, to be honest, but also just because I'd never worked in a large corporation and I felt that that would be valuable experience to have if I want to go and launch a successful initiative myself or find ways to help other initiatives, other startups be successful. Uh, so I was very, very fortunate to land the internship with Amazon and even more fortunate to, to, to get the full-time offer out of that. Um, so I spent about four and a half years after the internship full-time at Amazon and tried to stay in touch with new, new initiatives, ventures, the startup space, whatever capacity possible. So um, after my first role, because I was assigned to it in, in retail, I moved out as the first marketing hire for um, Amazon Lending, a fintech program within the company. Um, then I moved over to, after that role, to, to lead an email marketing team at Amazon Advertising, which at the time was just beginning to spin off as its own business entity. Um, I was actually there when they rebranded and the Amazon Media Group and Amazon Marketing Services into the Amazon Advertising Entity, um, which was a, a pretty pretty wild experience, actually, to kind of get to witness that firsthand, what that looks like inside of a large company. Um, uh, right around then, you know, we launched a couple products there, and I really wanted to learn more about uh, go-to-market processes. So I accepted a role with devices, leading go-to-market for Echo devices at Amazon. Um, less of a startup focus, but really getting more of that go-to-market experience, which I think, and I'm increasingly coming to realize is integral to, to any startup, especially a tech startup, right? Because at some point you're bringing a product or service to market. And that really in this day and age is its own discipline. Um, very engaging one in my, in my opinion. Um, and then after that role during COVID, I, I moved over to Amazon Launchpad, which, you know, direct relationship with startups. That's what the program does. It supports um, e new e-commerce ventures and startups on the Amazon platform. Very cool role. That team is fantastic. One of the best teams at Amazon, in my opinion. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and during that time, I was working as a mentor wherever I could. And I say working, not, not in a paid sense, just volunteering, you know, and trying to get involved in as many different organizations and groups in the area, you know, investor groups, um, accelerators, that sort of thing. I, I was a uh, mentor resident to Galvanize for a little bit. Um, which was a lot of fun. And right around then, I connected with Jeremy Zaretsky over at um, Founder Institute in Seattle uh, as a mentor originally. And then after doing that for a year or two, Jeremy invited me to join as a director to help run the accelerator. So I'm still doing that. So, you know, I, I've always been very inspired by the kinds of folks who work in the startup space who sort of just create their own role. You know, they don't have a fixed job necessarily, you know, with a, with a nine to five sort of structure, or, or maybe they do and they're doing everything outside that. But they just kind of pull together expertise in a space, build a sort of personal brand and reputation for themselves, and you know, just kind of take projects that they find interesting and engaging. I feel like there's a certain type of individual I encounter in, in, in the world of tech startups that, that sort of fits in this bucket. And, and that, that's kind of the direction I, I think I've ended up finding myself going in, you know, trying to 
develop expertise in a relevant area, develop the connections and network in the startup space, and and really be able to move fluidly between roles to kind of follow follow passions and interests. Um, a good friend of mine said to me recently that he's learned not to not to work against his own curiosity, and I thought, what a brilliant phrase! Love it so much, and uh, you know, I've kind of adopted that as as, <laughs> as a guide guide light for myself at this point. So we got a lot, a lot to go through there, but let's be, go back just for a minute. So yeah. both your parents were entrepreneurs. Talk about how, how seeing like two parents as entrepreneurs influenced you. Yeah, there's pros and cons. So they were entrepreneurs in the sense that they had small businesses, not you know a, a venture back startup or anything like that. So my father, of course, had the, the farm, as I mentioned. Uh, my mother started a, a dog daycare um, when I was about, I want to say 10 or 11. Before that, she'd had a baking business. Um, before that, she'd done uh, daycare for children when I was younger. Um, so, you know, lots of, lots of different things that she tried out that would enable her to, you know, I was homeschooled uh, up until college and so was my brother. So, you know, she was looking for things that would enable her to kind of still have that level of engagement, um, and also be able to try and earn some money. The dog daycare, as it turned out, took off. Um, as far as we can tell, it's the largest one in the area, possibly the largest one in the area. And it's still going on right now. It's still going, yeah. Very, very successful. Um, and it's, it's really just been... I think pretty incredible for me to get to kind of watch how that worked out, right? As a child and watch, you know, being that it isn't a startup, it was, it's essentially its growth was limited deliberately, right? Because it got to a point where mom felt that, you know, if the business grew any further, it would exceed her span of personal control. And, and that, that was where she was comfortable. That's where she wanted the business, um, which I think is true of a lot of small business owners. And so she's grown it within those confines and managed the business, brought on employees, brought on managers. And it's just been really interesting to watch you know, someone build a successful business without knowing what they're doing to start, right? Figuring it out as they as they go. Um, really quite inspiring. So from my point of view, it was really interesting because, you know, I had these great examples of the, you know, people of my two parents, you know, operating these two very different types of businesses and, you know, the, the, the pains that they went through, the, the triumphs, what led to success, what didn't, how they thought about it. The downside was that I didn't have anyone as a role model for a more conventional path to employment. So I, I was raised very much with this attitude that, you know, office life is more or less death. Um, and, and you don't take a job like that, unless, you know, unless, unless your life depends on it. And right around my late teens, early 20s, it occurred to me, I thought, you know, neither one of my parents has ever had a job like that. They, they, don't, they don't really know. I'm going to go give it a shot. And that's, that's around when I accepted the role with, with government. And I decided I actually quite like working in an office. Um, definitely beats pruning vines in a field in February, I'll tell you that. Uh, so, you know, as, as, a, as always, I think there's kind of a middle ground. And so part of that course, I had to chart for myself, but, you know, part of it, I, I definitely had some really excellent role models in, in my two parents, but uh, definitely a, a different upbringing, I think, than a lot of my colleagues that I, that I talked to and work with, for sure. And with a doggy dicker, it just proves that you never know what's going to hit it off, right? You might think you have yeah. like off the wall idea, you might, whatever it might be, but you just don't know what people are going to pay for until you put it out there in the market. Yeah, that's, Exactly right. And, and that's one of the things, right? Because when it started, you know, a lot of people, myself included, you know, to what extent that was relevant at the age of 10, thought that it was kind of bonkers, right? I mean, this was back, let's see, this would have been right around 2000, 1999, maybe. So really bonkers sort of back then. They like it was 2022, where people do that stuff all the time. Exactly, exactly. Now, we didn't know it at the time. But as it turned out, the timing was perfect. We were just riding the crest of, and I say we, because I was pretty actively involved in helping with the business in the early days, actually. Um, but uh, you know, there, there really was this burgeoning um, social shift in terms of attention towards pets and the money people were willing to spend on their pets. Um, and we had a bit of a clue because there was actually a smaller uh, dog daycare down the street. And the, the owner was the one who, who really encouraged my mom to go for it. But she said, look, I've got a waiting list that's bigger than the number of dogs I can currently accommodate. I'm desperate for someone to take them off my hands. I'll give you advice to set up. And she did. She came over and gave some advice to set up. And ultimately, you know, they went very different directions with the two businesses. But I think that impetus and initial encouragement was was very very important, you know, to get things going. Yes. So next, you volunteer for an organization called Built by Girls. Can you talk about that some? Yeah, that one. Unfortunately, not not a lot coming through there in the past year or two. But when I started about I want to say three four years ago, it's a really cool organization. They're based out on the East Coast. Basically, what they do is they work with young women um, in high school and college uh, who are interested in roles in the tech industry, both technical and non technical positions. And they try to match them with mentors working in that industry, both men and women. Um, and they've got a really structured approach. Um, there's a there's a fixed term for each, uh, you know, like 
advisory match, let's say. And, and of course, you're welcome to continue the engagement after that if both parties want to, but, but that's kind of where they, where they set it. They've got a platform where everything and all communication is managed. And then they have a very clear set of expectations for the mentors and the mentees you know, throughout the course of the program. Um, I think the structure is really nice because uh, there can be so much difference, frankly, in the, the experience and areas of life of the mentor and the mentee. Um, that often it can be really hard to kind of set expectations and having that framework makes it really, really helpful. And all these girls a certain age? Uh, high school to college. So okay. I'd say, I think the youngest mentee I had personally was probably 18, 17 or 18, and the oldest maybe 22 through that program. Um, and my partner does it as well. And I think she's actually still in touch with one of her mentees who's probably 23 or 24 at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, you can continue the engagement if you want after the fact. Um, but yeah, it's super cool program, and and uh, I think it's really great because, you know, I talked to some of some of the young women that I've I've been matched with through the through the program, and you just start to realize they just really don't have in many cases they, they don't have great examples of of other women, you know, succeeding in these spaces, and often they're really shocked when I'll put them in touch with, you know, my own colleagues, right, women working in different technical roles, especially you know women in very very technical roles, you know, data science or or engineering roles, developer roles, whatever. And, and getting to have that kind of exposure, you know, some of the conversations we've had after they've connected with those people have just been really remarkable, you know, kind of bring a tear to your eye sort of things. You just say, I didn't, I just never really thought of this as an opportunity or as a possibility, right? Now that I've talked to this, this woman, I've, I've charted like a course for myself if I want to get into this space. A lot of them are really interested in product management. Um, and, and that's probably just because you know, that's kind of a technical area that closely aligns with my background. And so that's what, that's what I get matched with. But um, I think it's really, really exciting to see, um, you know, there's so much benefit that you see to every stakeholder involved from employees to customers to investors when you have good gender diversity on a team, right? Everything from the product design and development to return on investment. And uh, I'll, I'll say anecdotally, the best teams that I've worked on personally in terms of team culture and just kind of the atmosphere, stress levels have always been the ones where there's a good balance of men and women, not just throughout the team, but in positions of authority. That's what's really key. There's a lot of teams and you see this in marketing in particular, where if you, if you, if you just look at the gender balance, it'll often be 50, 50, or sometimes even 60, 40, uh, more, more women than men. And then when you break it down by seniority, you get to the first level of management and there's no more women, right? It's all men in, in management positions. Um, if, if you can find a team where there's there's better gender balance, you just tend to have, in my experience, just a much, much better team culture, management culture. Yeah, I, I think every stat out there, every business study done forever always says the more diverse your team is, the better ROI, better KPIs, yeah. more revenue. I mean, yeah, it's there's nothing, there's no one study out there that says non-diverse is the way to go. Everything says be diverse and make more money. That's yeah, exactly it. And, it's, and it's not even close. It's not even close. Yeah. And you see it in startups too, right? Uh, diverse founding teams in terms of gender diversity, uh, founding teams with women on average see something like 60% better returns on investment than, than all male teams. Now, to be fair, I mean, a big part of that is because those teams with women are being discriminated against, right? You just look at the numbers, right? I think it's last year, 2.1% of venture funding went to teams with women, even though teams with women represent something like 30 or 40% of new, new businesses. Um, you know, so it's essentially a fire sale, right? There aren't as many investors competing to invest in those companies, which means the investors who do are getting better terms, um, which is not great. Um, so some of that, that 60% improvement on, on investment, that's going to change as, as hopefully we improve this, you know, the, the allocation of investment dollars. Um, but I strongly suspect we're going to continue to see a trend there, right? If, you know, it, it really, we, we see those kinds of patterns of better results with better diversity just across the board. I'd be very surprised if that didn't hold true consistently in founding teams as well, even once we start to see better equality among, you know, uh, patterns of investment. So Levi, back to the females in the STEM. I'm making this number up, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. I think I remember reading somewhere like in, in elementary, like 80% of elementary school girls are interested in STEM. Okay. By the time they get to senior high school, it's on like five to 10%, right? Sure. Why does that number drop so low? Just societal pressures or just, and how do we fix that, you think? Well, I mean, I have opinions, but I'll, I'll just put out there, right? I'm, I'm disadvantaged on this point in two respects. One, like I mentioned, I was homeschooled. I didn't go to public school. Number two, um, I'm not a woman, right? So I haven't had that experience and I can't really you know, talk to a woman's experience, obviously. Um, what I do see, you know, at least in the tech sector is just a tacit difference in how women are treated frequently, right? Um, and 
you know, much to my own chagrin, I've, I've seen this in myself. I, I was talking to my partner about this the other day. I was having a conversation. I was, I was at my dentist's office and uh, my hygienist asked me, you know, what, what my startup does. And I was explaining it. And it's, it's a fairly complex topic. So I was trying to simplify it as much as possible. And then a few minutes later, the dentist came in. And uh, so the hygienist was a woman, the dentist is a, is a man. And he asked me the same question. And I, I was halfway through my description and I realized, you know, I was just, without thinking about it, using significantly more technical language with the dentist. And I reflected on that after the fact. And I thought, well, is it, is it because, you know, I have some idea that he's a doctor and therefore, you know, for some reason, you know, more better able to understand this. And I thought, no, that's, that's really not what it is. I think it was really, it was just this knee-jerk reaction in my mind that I was reacting differently to the fact that he was male, you know? And this is, these are things I try to be conscious of. And I, I still find myself engaging in these unconscious and sexist behaviors, right? Um, and so I think if you're not really trying to self-examine and to acknowledge that you do have these biases, I mean, you in the general sense, that one does have these biases and that they are going to manifest and, and it's important to be on the lookout for them and try to correct for them, you know, that's just going to be self that's just going to be perpetuated, right? Um, being in marketing, a lot of the teams that I've led personally have been all or majority women. And uh, I've been really fortunate enough to, to, to have the kind of women on my team who are not afraid to point out to me when I'm engaged in that kind of behavior. And they have done so. And it's been a very illuminating experience, right? Because I start to realize where my own behavior is perpetuating, perpetuating these kinds of, um, you know, biases and equities or what a lot of people might call microaggressions and, and try to uh, try to improve it. So I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, if we're seeing this among um, adults, often adults who are intentionally attempting not to engage in this kind of behavior, and you can still see these kinds of patterns, you know, in, in industry, I can only imagine what it must be like in school with children, right? Um, and like, you know, I mean that literally, I can only imagine I haven't been in school, but my, my, my guess is, you know, uh, years, years of dealing with those kinds of small, constant, you know, negative nudges and, and uh, lack of representation, lack of examples of people who look like you succeeding in the ways that you want to, that has to have an effect, right? And I, I strongly suspect that's, that's why we see that pattern. So a, a good example, maybe from the point of view, a better example of that. So Sheryl Sandberg, you know, she wrote a book, Lean In, a little while ago. Yeah. And so she's telling the story where, um, she met, she met someone at a store and the lady said, hey, I went to your webinar and I went to your in-person conference back, blah, blah, blah. So Cher said, well, how, what do you think? Well, actually, I was disappointed. What do you mean? Well, it was good and all, but at the end, you said, no more questions. I got to wrap up. And then 10 guys op- put their hands up and you, and, you, and, uh, and you let them all of them ask questions, but none of those females did. And she's like, if I'm the head of the lead-in movement, I'm doing this, like, how can I expect anyone else to even do better than I am, right? If she's the one saying lean in and, wow. you know, so I thought it was pretty thought provoking when I read that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's very thought provoking. Yeah, it's it's very very interesting, and it, it gets you start getting into very sticky questions. You know, I know there's been a lot of debate over the past few years about you know salary differences between men and women, and to what extent that might be driven by uh, you know women maybe not self advocating as much as. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer. That's the a big reason. I I think there is, but then we have to go a little bit deeper, right? Why is that the case? And and you know, I, I think in a lot of cases, the, the institutions that, that we have are really doing a disservice to women in those situations, right? I mean, because essentially what we're doing, right, in a situation like that is we're saying, hey, we want, we want a good gender balance because we want good diversity. We want a diversity of perspectives and personalities, right? That's great. But to get here, we're going to need you to conform exactly to the behaviors, behavioral patterns of, of the dominant group. That to me seems a little bit absurd and self-defeating, right? So we can look at it and say, okay, maybe women aren't self-advocating, but I don't think the solution is to say, now women, you have to go self-advocate better, <laughs> right? I think the solution is is to look at it and say, okay, what about this situation is creating this problem, and can we remove, can we remove this particular issue entirely, right? Can we look at something like, for example, you know, better communication of salary ranges up front, for example, or you know, are there other policies or practices that we can engage in that might might enable us to welcome this particular type of diversity, this, this particular difference of behavior, right, without resulting in unfairly unequal outcomes for the participants, if that makes sense. It does. And I think it goes a step further. And this is like a slight exaggeration, but not much. A guy gets hired for a job. He, he's over six months. Hey, boss, I've been on time every day for six months. I need a raise, right? And he may or may not get it. A female will like close a $10 million deal, no one or whatever, like increase ROI by 13%. You ask for a raise. Oh, no, I'm just doing my job. Yes, I could not agree with that more. I, I'm not going to go into too many details here because I don't want to give away like personal information or anything, but I have had personal experiences, you know, where I've seen firsthand how 
men and women on my my own team, how their achievements have been received very differently, um, you know, by peers and superiors within the same organization. Um, I've experienced it is. I've I've had so much more difficulty in my career getting women promoted in situations where I'm not the sole decision maker um, than getting men promoted. Uh, it, it's 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 exactly like you're describing, right? The the same achievement, right? For, for you know, a man might do something and they'll say, well, he's showing great potential, and, and a woman might, you know, be in the same exact situation. They say, well, she hasn't she hasn't accomplished this yet, right? So, well, wait a minute, that's the definition of a double standard, right? And you know, women say this all the time because they experience it personally and they see it. But you know, I'm I'm what I'm talking about is the kind of thing that happens behind the closed doors, you know, away from away from the people in question between the decision makers who in organizations that engage in this kind of thing are typically predominantly male in the management structure, right? And, and they don't mean to be malicious. This isn't a conscious, well, I, I, I hope it's not a conscious uh, discrimination, but it's still happening. They're, 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 they're looking at the two candidates, the two situations through entirely different lenses. They don't even realize they're doing it, right? Um, and, and I shouldn't say we, they, I should say we, because I'm 100% I'm certain I'm guilty of this as well. Um, but and that that's what I'm talking about when it's incumbent on us to um, to acknowledge that whatever our intentions, we're almost certainly engaging in this kind of behavior, right? As as individuals and as professionals, and so it's important to 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 recognize that. Recognize that doesn't mean that you're a bad person, right? We're, we're all human; we make mistakes. But it does mean that you know you have some moral responsibility. I personally would argue um, to to try and uh, you know accommodate that fact, to acknowledge it, and try to find ways to to correct for it if possible. And like I said, everyone has a bias. Like you might decide between like who you want to promote, you know, Bob or Susan. And you right. might not know it, but in the back of your mind, but you buy, hey, Bob is single, no kids. He can be a guard, hold, get hard. Yeah. You know, Susan, she doesn't have any kids yet. I know she's married and she's going to be that itch and we're going to lose her for like whatever time it is. So let's promote the male, you know? Yeah, I've, I've had some of these conversations where, you know, someone will ask me, you know, I want to hire so-and-so or I want to promote so-and-so and they'll say, oh, you know, you know, they'll, they'll start asking questions. And after a couple minutes, I go, are you trying to figure out if she's going to have kids soon? You know, it's just super not okay. Um, one little technique I like to try and use, and I forget who suggested this to me. I didn't come up with it, but it's just to try and imagine if, if you can switch the genders and, and just try and think, would I think about this person or the situation the same way if the genders were reversed, right? Or if they were changed in some way. And if you can really kind of commit to that little thought experiment, it can be surprisingly revealing. I mean, like in the example I gave you earlier of my own experience with my do my dentist and, and hygienist. Um, but, you know, even even that's imperfect, right? It's difficult to do and it doesn't always occur to one to, to, to try and, and do that. Um, but it's a start. So so last Saturday, I went to this event at the Boeing Museum of Flight. My friend Kerry G put on. It's like a base of panel of aviation military people, like retired. Oh, wow. And so this, or like one, one lady, she was a YouTube pilot. Another lady is like from the two words, like did some great stuff, right? And so one lady, I can remember her name, a retired Air Force Colonel, 30 years, flew all kind of, all time air, uh, aircraft, right? She's a senior person at Civilian South Air Force at an Air Force base in California. And she tells me at least once a month, someone asks her, who did I turn my um, security passes into, right? And she said one time this low level employee well, explain to her how an uh, engine works. It's so, like, I'm a retired colonel, blah, blah, I have two masters. Let me, you know, let me tell you how it works, right? And it's like, just ridiculous, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's really, really remarkable. I'm, I mean, the, the closest I can relate to that is, is uh, you know, throughout my life, it's been very, very common when I'm in a place that uh, someone will assume that I work there, uh, especially if it's, if it's kind of a regional position, right? If I'm in like a Best Buy or something. Um, or a restaurant, it's, it's very common. Uh, it's happened several times at uh, Benner Royal Hall, actually, when I go to the symphony, my, my partner and I really enjoy doing that. And uh, I've had people come up to me and assume I'm an usher, uh, even though the ushers wear uniforms that look nothing like the clothes that, that I, I would be wearing at the time. So I think it's the closest I can relate because you know I, I never really thought much of it. And then when my partner and I first started dating, she's she's uh, white. Um, and uh, you know I was describing this experience, just kind of assuming it was something that happened to everybody. And she said, you know, it's never happened to me. And she got very upset the first time it happened in front of her uh, because she felt that it was very racist, right? That, you know, given my darker complexion that people were maybe more inclined to assume that I, I worked in a place. And, uh, you know, since, since then talking to folks who work in DEI and just kind of reading off on it myself, I've learned that that, that is in fact a pattern that's seen among people with, with darker skin. I had no idea. Um, and, and frankly can get quite irritating. Sometimes people will get 
downright unpleasant. Um, you know, if they think you work there and, and you're not responding the way they want, or sometimes even when you tell them you don't work there, uh, if, they, if they've gotten themselves all worked up at that point, it's, I think it's hard for them to let the, uh, the anger go. What they call it, the, the Karen complex? I wasn't going to call it that, but yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of that. Yep. I, I had a lady one time in a shopping mall I was in. She came storming out of the bathroom. She was mad as hell about something. And uh, she comes up to me and starts telling me how there's so much water on the floor and someone could slip and hurt themselves. And I am completely confused, right? I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, did she think I spilled something? And then she pauses mid-tirade. I think she saw that I was completely confused. And she goes, you work here, right? I said, no, no, I don't work here. I have no idea why she thought I worked there. I wasn't, I literally walked out of the bathroom. I was still, you know, drying my hands off. I was not wearing anything passing for a uniform. And I said, I, you know, I don't work here. And she goes, oh, and then resumed the tirade. <laughs> Just my, my, my employment status apparently had made, made, no, uh, made no difference in that case. Um, so I, I basically ran away. I wasn't, wasn't allowed to deal with that, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, that and getting followed around scores and whatnot. But anyway, the point I was going to make is that's about as close as I think I can relate to, to the experience that you just described. But I think every, every woman I know that I broach this topic with has at least one really good story along yeah. the lines of what you just described. And it's made me try to be much, much more careful because again, I realized a tendency in myself to launch into an explanation of something with women, whereas with men, I'll, I'll more frequently stop and ask if they're familiar with it already, um, you know, just without thinking. And so I, I try to be a lot more conscious about that. Because um, that's the other thing you see, right? A lot of a lot of women, at least in my experience, will often, you know, in the interest of being polite, will not say anything, right? And they'll, they'll let you go on. Um, and a lot of men will not because they're very eager to <laughs> prove to you they know what you're talking about. Um, you know, and, and that's just not a situation that I want to create. I, I appreciate the kindness, but, uh, you know, I think it's, 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 again, it's, it's, uh, it's not great to present that kind of double standard. You know? Yeah. And you know, it's bad when, when it makes it on primetime TV, you, you see a TV show where they have a business meeting and the lady will have this idea, blah, blah, blah. And like, that's stupid, Susan, you know, yeah. sit down. And like seconds later, Bob say, say that thing. Bob's a genius. Susan, yeah. how can you think about that? She was like, I literally just said the same thing. Oh, there's some good, there's a, I think there's a Pixar short on more or less that topic. And then there's, um, oh, I hope I'm remembering her name correctly. I think it's Sarah Cooper, the comedian. Uh, she's ex-Google. She actually has a special on Netflix. She has online some really biting pieces about these kinds of phenomena. Very entertaining to read. And frankly, very educational, right? As a guy, right? You read these kinds of things and you go, oh yeah, like I've seen this. I didn't realize this was this was a pattern associated with you know sexist behavior or prejudice, or whatever. Um, you know, it's 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 really interesting to, to see those kinds of things. So yeah. And then like you're a company you started with KCB, you're like, I, I don't want I want to hire, I want to be diverse, right? But first thing you know, well, one thing I think we gotta agree on, like diverse hiring is not easy, right? You just can't say, I'm gonna hire this demographic, right? First of all, they do have to be qualified and that they want to work for you, right? Yeah. And all the kind of stuff. Like, you're just gonna say, I'm gonna hire XYZ and manage their career, right? So it's it's harder than thinking people is right. But then if you're a startup company and you have 10 white guys, can you really go, I'm gonna hire a Hispanic female? Yeah. Like why would that person anyone non-white want to come work for you, right? Yeah. The That's... culture is a bro culture, you're probably yeah. ping pong beer, like. And, and I understand it's hard to be intentional, right? You know, it's and you, when you start a startup, you know, you might want to hire your friends because you trust them. They have the skills you need, but it's, it's a challenge, I think, all the way across the board. Absolutely. Yeah, it, I, I, I completely agree. And that's no, no excuse for shying away from it, but I think it is important to acknowledge that it is a challenge. I remember when I was in my, my MBA program, we had a, like a, one of those you know, real world projects we were working on. We had a startup in the city that I think they had around 14, 15 employees at the time, a tech startup, so mostly engineers. And they had recognized that they had extremely poor gender diversity in their team. And they had, like, again, out of, out of around 15 people, they had two women. Um, and they said they were really struggling to get women to apply to their roles, and they weren't sure what they were doing wrong, and they wanted to see if they could help. And so, you know, this, this startup was assigned to us as a team to try and come up with some ideas for their, their hiring. And I remember, you know, they, they shared with us some of their material, their website for hiring, you know, a little brochure thing they had. And uh, I started cracking up when I saw it. I said, well, you know, I see a big problem right off the bat. <laughs> You've got all of your photos of the entire team. All these guys, you know, they've got the front row kneeling down and the back row standing and all these guys in there, you know, they're smiling and everything. In every single photo, the two women looked like someone was holding a gun to their head, right? Arms crossed and like, yeah, not, like not, the best, not, the, not the best optics you're trying Incredibly to hire females. uncomfortable. And I looked at this. Like, thought, we're, okay. we're prisoners here. Don't come. Yeah, exactly. They, they, looked, they looked not just unhappy, but unsafe. Right, just their body language was screaming this, 
And I said, I mean, that's that's something you got to deal with. Like, why 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 do these women feel this way? Because clearly, something in every photo, both women, this this body language in in every case. And I, I said, you know, that's something I think you guys got to address. Um, unfortunately, I, I never did find out exactly what what the company culture was like because it was only a couple weeks project. But um, but you know, I I think you really have to approach something like this as as a true believer, so to speak, right? If you're coming at it and you're going, well, we need more women on the team because it doesn't look good that we don't have enough women on the team. You know, that's, yeah, that's not a good answer. You need to be coming at it from a direction, in my opinion. And I let me say up front, I am not and do not pretend to be a BEI professional. But you know, as as a as a manager, the, the way I think about it is you need to understand why it is important to have gender diversity, what benefits and value it brings, both in a in in a purely pragmatic outputs oriented sense, but also in a in a social equity sense, right? I mean, I can't speak for others, but I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, you know, my own behavior is is unfairly discriminating or or, or uh, preventing people from fair access to good opportunities, right? Um, and uh, you know, I, I think you really need to embrace those concepts. You really you really need to be motivated by a desire to correct those two issues, right? Or, or to take advantage of the opportunity in one case and correct the issue in the other case. Um, and then uh, the biggest thing, you know, people talk about, oh, it's so difficult, it's so hard. Well, you know, my response is generally listen more, right? There's there's plenty of people out there who have had these experiences who can give you some ideas on, you know, how to improve, how to avoid creating, you know, bad environments, bad situations, or, you know, mimicking the same mistakes that that have been, you know, uh, happening for for decades in in the professional world or, or centuries probably. Um, but you know, it's it's a question of having the the humility really to be willing to go out and just listen what what is wrong what is broken how do we fix it um and i think if you can do that honestly that's that could be steps one through three for a lot of the organizations i've been part of just frankly you don't you don't you know that's even before trying to hire a dei professional or anything like that just just go talk to people listen what are, what are the problems what are the pain points what can be corrected you know the folks experiencing this in your organization they're going to be your best authority on how to correct the problems that are preventing you from you know, improving diversity, if that's really your goal. Yeah, I'm a big believer that you should hire the best person for the job. However, I said that, I also believe that you go to any demographic and find the best person for that job. So that's such a great point, right? People talk about hiring the best person for the job. Absolutely, I agree. But what are the odds that the best person for the job is consistently a white dude named Chris? Every single time. Right, for example. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and you have to look at that and go, okay, maybe there's another problem with the work here. So then my big question is always, you say you want the best person for the job, how are you evaluating that? That is inherently subjective. There's maybe and, and where are you recruiting at? Are you going the same recruiting fair in Bellevue every single time? Right. Or you know, at an even more granular level, it's how are you evaluating the outcomes of their resume? You know, their resume, the outcome of their interview. What kinds of questions are you asking them? Right? Are they different? You know. So when you can make it as a, and and I think this is why there's there's a lot of research in it hurts me to say this because I despise standardized testing, but that's found that you actually get better hiring outcomes with a standardized approach, often with, with tests that don't involve, you know, a human interviewer. Um, because, you know, it falls into the same pattern when you can make decisions like this, you, you know, using an algorithmic approach, a consistent objective approach, even a very simple one often outperforms a subjective, quote unquote, expert opinion. Um, and I think you see this in hiring as well. And, where I think you see a really dangerous mix, right, is when you have an approach that is fundamentally subjective, because it is, um, and you pretend that it's objective, right? You you put you put some kind of numeric scale to it, you know, or or some kind of an assessment protocol that breaks things down into into, into numbers. Um, it gives this veneer of objectivity, but it's false. But the problem is when you have a veneer of objectivity, you stop questioning it, right? You go, okay, well, this person's an eight out of 10, it's been decided and therefore stamp, we're done, right? No, that's a, that's a subjective assessment. Just because you've given it a number grade rather than a letter grade or a, you know, a qualitative evaluation doesn't make it any less subjective. And as soon as you have subjectivity, you have room for bias. For example, myself personally, when somebody says to me that they're a good judge of character, it's an immediate warning sign. And apologies to anyone who's a good judge of character out there. But the reason it's a warning sign is because if you believe that you're a good judge of character and you make a snap decision about me, that's based fundamentally on intuition, on emotional reasoning, right? If it's not based on something objective, then that's where it's coming from, which means that it could be based on inherent biases that I have no control over, right? You may have had some bad experiences with people who look like me. 
maybe you grew up in a bad neighborhood that was populated largely by by Puerto Ricans, for example, right? And and you were scared of them. That's completely legitimate. And maybe now as an adult, you know, you don't necessarily associate that consciously because you recognize that, you know, just because some members of an ethnic group behave a certain way doesn't mean everyone in that ethnic group behave a certain way. But your emotional mind, your subconscious mind doesn't necessarily kind of internalize and digest that, right? There's, there's some really interesting, I was just reading a book called The Righteous Mind, um, a really interesting book. They were talking about research where um, people have an immediate good, bad, like visceral emotional reaction to literally everything, right? And it colors their conscious assessment of that thing, person experience, whatever, afterwards in a way that they're not even you know, aware of. So if you have a deep-seated subjective bias against people with darker skin tones, as, as many Americans do, frankly, probably myself included, right? This isn't saying anyone's a bad person. It's not something you have control over, but you need to be aware of it. So if you have that bias, that's affecting your assessment of people. If you believe yourself then to be a good judge of character, guess what? You're now less critical about your own opinion, guaranteed, right? You're not going back to questioning it. You're, if you're a good judge of character, then your judgment of character must be good, right? That's the kind of tautology that you know we tend to engage in mentally. And that means that you know people subjected to your judgment of their character have very little recourse to change your assessment, right? Because it's generally not going to be based on something practical or objective. Um, so you know that's why I feel like you know we need if you read like uh, Daniel Kahneman and all the behavioral psychologists, he talks about our uh, what is it, system one and system two. And basically, the distinction is between our autonomic sort of heuristic processes, right, where we evaluate something and we make a snap decision that feels good versus the more cognitively intense um, reasoning activities, what we might call it, consider more of a, a rational um, thought process, rational cognition. Um, and we typically tend not to engage in, in that kind of cognition as much. It's energy intensive, it takes more work and it takes time. Um, but in these cases where you're trying to suss out, you know, inadvertent discrimination and bias, it's very, very important in my opinion to be engaged in that system as often as possible to constantly be questioning subjective assessments and subjective decisions and the processes by which you you, which you reach those decisions. And what gets me, it kills me all the time. Someone says, I'm a hiring expert. Are you really? Like everyone you hired went on to have great careers in your company, right? Like you didn't make no bad hiring decisions. I'm a hiring expert. I just, that's just, that's well, okay. I, I've never believed that people, I heard people say that. What does that mean, right? Define your terms. What does that mean? You know, you see there's, there's, there's a lot of research showing that um, women will, on average, apply to a job when they exceed 100% of yeah. the requirements. And men like, it's like 70%. Yeah. Right? And men like, oh, well, I can read the, I, I, if I can, as long as I read, I can apply for it. Exactly. And I will say personally, absolutely. If I meet about 70% of the minimum requirements, I'm applying to that job, assuming I want to, right? Um, and I've seen that as a hiring manager as well. And this is why, you know, I, I was just thinking about this yesterday. I think in the course of my career, I've, I've, I've definitely hired a lot more women than men. And, and this isn't out of preference or anything. It's just because I have, a, I have a sort of system that I personally developed for evaluating candidates as well, as objectively as I can. Um, so I've stolen the rating system from, from Founder Institute. They've got a really interesting approach for evaluating founder pitches. And then my inputs are, you know, if I'm working with a recruiter, whatever the recruiter tells me, then the person's LinkedIn and their resume. Um, and then if it's a creative role, then their portfolio as well. Um, and then what I try to do is I try to, I go through and, and I, I assign a numeric score for each of the candidates I have in front of me to each of those items. And I'll do like all the resumes first and then all the LinkedIn profiles, et cetera. I try to keep myself um, as distant from the person as possible. So, you know, if I can separate names, I'll do so. I try not to look at, you know, images like, you know, headshots or whatever. And then at the end, I go and I'll add up all the scores. And, and what I'll frequently find is that the candidate that ends up coming out, you know, as the top candidate, is not the candidate that I would have selected, in fact, it's almost never the candidate that I would have subjectively selected just based on my own sort of gut reaction to their different profiles. And that candidate, I think it's safe to say roughly 90, 90 to 95% of the time is, is typically a woman um, because the women who apply to the roles are typically far more qualified than the men who apply to the same roles. Um, and that's just consistently been my experience across several different companies. Um, so I look at that and I go, well, if I'm hiring you know, the best candidate for the role, I've got someone here who is approachable, open to learning, has demonstrated extremely strong expertise, has more years of experience and more, you know, quantifiable accomplishments. You know, just just it's kind of a no-brainer once once you 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 know you look at the resume, the accomplishments, and the CV. Um, and so that's just how it's kind of panned out. Um, so you know, when a company tells me that they hire the best, they want to hire the best person for the role, and you know, I I, I see a whole bunch of you know guys who all kind of look the same, have 
and, and I say look the same, not in terms of like physical features, but look the same in terms of their profile, right? You know, their, their history, where they went to school, maybe their age, whatever. I have to really question that, you know? I, I don't think you're hiring the person in the best world. I think you're hiring the person that you feel most comfortable with, right? And that's a different thing. But that's a characteristic of that autonomic heuristic system, right? It's substituting the question being asked, who's the best person for the role, for the question that you want to ask or the question that's easier to answer. Who's the person I'm most comfortable with, right? And I think that's what you kind of see happening in a lot of these types of hiring processes. But again, just my opinion. Yeah, you always hear people say, oh, no, what's the, is, do they pass a beer test? Well, does passing a beer test act make them the best person in the job? Yes. And in we're supposed to be professional, right? You, I mean, does it matter you get along with the people you work with? Yes, maybe it does, but it shouldn't matter more that you perform on the job, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to get along with them, but it doesn't mean they have to be, they have to all have to be the kind of person you want to hang out with after work with a beer, right? I mean, I, I've got plenty of friends I'd love to hang out with after work for a beer. I wouldn't necessarily want to work with those folks. Yeah. Um, I, I got plenty of friends like that. I'll have a beer with them, yeah. but I will not hire them to cut my grass. Much less work on a startup with them. <laughs> <laughs> and and same token, some of the best people I've worked with, you know, we we don't we just don't really click on a social level, right? It's not that we dislike each other. It's just like you know we wouldn't really particularly enjoy hanging out for two hours over a beer and having a conversation. We're just different people. We don't click that way. That's fine. But you know, if we can work well together, if we can work effectively together, that's that's what matters. Because you're talking about hiring an employee. You're not hiring a buddy, right? Um, and and I I think that's important. I always I cringe a little bit when people talk about you know the beer test, the airport test, whatever, because to me that that's just that's the height of that's not just accepting a, a high level of sub subjectivity, it's it's actually prioritizing it, right? Yeah. And that that to me is problematic. Especially if you're remote remote now, like if you're remote, does the beer test even matter at all? That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, in, in a remote environment, what I'm hiring for, I'm looking for people who can be self-directed or autonomous, uh, people who, who like having that kind of, you know, ability to set their own schedule and set their own priorities. Um, you know, I, I talk about half joking, but with my, with my teams and direct reports that I like to describe my management style as I call it my snowplow theory of management. My idea is that as long as I'm leading teams, you know, full of these very highly capable professionals, very self-motivated professionals, which is, you know, not 100% true across the board, but I've been really fortunate in my career that those are the kinds of people that I've worked with and I really enjoy that. Um, you know, my role is really, they, they, they've got the motivation. They know they want to accomplish, they want to achieve. My role is to set them up for success and enable them to do that. It's to clear the path, get the crap and the bureaucracy out of the way, get, make sure that they have the tools and resources they need and make sure that they're not being, you know, bogged down with minutia and, and busy work so that they can actually accomplish things. And, and essentially just, just to make sure they're pointed in the right direction on a clear path, right? And, uh, and, and be there for support and whatnot. And I've just found really, really fantastic results uh, with the teams that I've been fortunate enough to be part of um, with that approach. Um, and you know, coupled with that, I, I have, I'm a really strong believer in the idea that people, people who are self-motivated, people who care um, about what they're doing, and I, I really think if people don't care about what they're doing, then there's a problem with the situation likely not with the person that needs to be addressed, but, um, you know, folks who are in a good situation where they're, they are motivated, um, they want to be successful, right? And if, if you give that person, if you treat them the way as though they're, they're in the position you want them to be, you give them the trust that, that you want them to, to, to deserve, uh, people rise to the occasion, right? And I, I always say, you know, I think it's probably, you know, it's got to be 90% of the time it works out, but I'll tell you, you know, I've been leading teams for five, six years now, I haven't had a single instance where somebody has um, you know, let, let down that, that sense of trust or be, betrayed the trust I put in them or, or let me down in terms of their, uh, you know, their drive to, to be successful. N not a single, not a single instance, right? So, so Leva, let's go back to your homeschool years. Yeah. By being homeschooled, do you think you missed out anything as far as the social aspect of growing up? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, you, you know, I, it was pretty isolating because also I grew up on a farm, right? So I was I was out in the middle of the country. So I had a couple childhood friends, but um, and my brother, but uh, definitely um, first couple of years of college were very challenging from a social perspective. Um, and I remember, and I've talked to my brother about this too, you know, having this surreal sense, feeling a bit like some sort of a strange uh, alien anthropologist, right? Observing the uh, my peers in their natural habitat and trying to figure out how to imitate them to. Uh, you know, fit in and not be a total weirdo. Um, I don't know that I quite succeeded. I'd still say I'm, I'm, I'm quite a weirdo, but I think at this point, I'm pretty comfortable with that. <laughs> so Levi, after Amazon, you want to work for a company. 
and you did a product market launch that didn't go that well. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the lessons learned and mistakes you made that you learned from to make yourself yeah. better? Great question. So I, I joined a, a healthcare company, multinational healthcare company, and I, I came on board in a pretty cool role. They were looking to launch a, a consumer facing product, consumer facing brand, I should say, for the, the first time uh, in the US. And so I was basically, it was what we call like an entrepreneurial role, right? So I was setting up a team and a business unit, owned a PL. Um, but instead of having to go solicit investment, I was basically just getting a, a budget assigned by the company. So very, very cool opportunity. Um, but I think the, ch the challenge was that coming into the company, um, the situation was a little different than how it was represented uh, before I joined. Uh, it was represented to me, you know, that basically they were just looking for someone to come on board, get the pilot going, and then they were off to the races. Um, and in reality, there had been some initial proposals put together for this role, for, for this uh, initiative, but there wasn't the executive alignment that needed to be there at the, the upper levels to really move forward. And so some executives wanted to move forward, some were ambivalent, some were pretty steadfastly blocking the initiative. Um, so, you know, in, in my time there, I, I, I built out a team, um, set up a turnkey pilot, had things ready to go. And uh, literally 48 hours before we were due to launch the pilot, uh, one of the executives uh, who I didn't know at the time was not in favor of moving forward, asked me to pause, um, you know, temporarily uh, while we sorted a few concerns out. But then it became a problem. We paused for a couple weeks and that pause turned into a month, into two months, into four months. And, uh, you know, I was trying a, a number of different approaches to the pilot to see if, you know, to try, try if, if, if different uh, scale, different channels, different, uh, you know, uh, levels of, of control over the pilot, you know, in terms of like restricting participants and whatnot, if anything would, would make the executives in question a little bit more comfortable and allow us to move forward. And just wasn't having a lot of luck. And I, I finally got to the point where I thought, you know, I moved into this role as a sort of soft landing into entrepreneurship. And I'm, you know, I wasn't getting to move forward. And I decided I was just getting tired of spinning my wheels. And that's why I, I left to, to join the startup where I'm at now. But I think in terms of learnings, um, the biggest thing for me really would just be to put more effort into really asking the difficult questions about where, where those executives were at and where the status of the program was, right? Why wasn't it moved forward while, while I was going through the interview process? What was holding things up? You know, what, what did they see the next three months looking like, the next six months? What were the big pain points or concerns around moving forward, that kind of thing? Um, that's really the same thing, honestly, that I tell any mentee as they're approaching a new job is, you know, just the same kind of questions you'd ask a hiring manager, right? Really just to kind of try and get at the, the, the thing is, you can't ask a question that's, that's just straight on the nose, typically, you know, what, what do you think of this project or what have you. What you need to ask are questions that put people into a mindset uh, that's very specific. So, for example, I, I tell mentees sometimes, rather than asking someone, you know, uh, what, uh, what's a great achievement in this role that I'm applying for? What does success look like in this role? You know, my suggestion is to ask a hiring manager, let's imagine it's nine months down the road and you're reflecting on my time here and I've been a really, really great employee. What have I accomplished in the last nine months that makes you feel that I was a really good hire, right? Now, it's a really convoluted way of asking the same question. But what I found in my personal experience is that that hiring manager, it's, it goes back to that system one, system two thing I was talking about, right? If I say, what does success look like? They go, oh, well, you know, you've got to, you know, execute projects to a high level. And if we're talking Amazon, right? You've got to, you know, exemplify the Amazon leadership principles. Okay, great. But that's really generic. That doesn't help you. When you ask the question the way I just rephrased it, what I, in my experience, what I've seen is the hiring manager just stop for a moment, right? And you can see they shift into system two, right? They're thinking, they're thinking more critically now. They go, oh, okay. And then they give you a real answer. And it's usually something along the lines of, well, we have this project we're working on and these are the points we haven't been able to move forward. And if you were able to resolve this, this, and this, that would be huge, right? Boom, now as an, as an applicant, you've got, you've, got, you've got your roadmap, right? You've got a concrete set of clear objectives, hopefully, you know, that tell you, if you can do this, you will be successful in this role. And that's, that's a gold mine. So I think applying that same perspective, um, going in and in the early days in the role would have been really, really helpful. Um, and really, and this is a lesson I learned doing freelance, and I really should have applied it here, but, you know, live and learn. It's, if I think it would have been really helpful if I had approached my project and the executive for the company, not as my management, but as my clients, right? And what I mean by that, and you maybe have experienced this yourself, actually, Jason, um, you know, you'll often find when you work with a client, they'll say, I need X, Y, Z, right? 
And you go, okay, and it's, it's a deliverable, it's a thing. You go, but what are your goals? And then they'll tell you your goals and you, you, you'll go, you know what? That's not what you need if this is your goal. What you need is this, right? And it really, it, you, you have to take the time and effort to dig into the client's requirements because the one thing I've learned in, in marketing at least is what the client tells you they need and what they actually need are nearly <laughs> always two different things. And I think it was the same case here, right? And I just unfortunately was going in much more with an employee mindset and not as you know an owner mindset, which is is uh, you can't admit that at Amazon they crucified, but <laughs> I'm safe now. <laughs> but I think that was the biggest thing, honestly. So Levi, can you tell more about about your role with Founders Institute and what, exactly what is Founders Institute? Yeah, I I this is one of my favorite topics, so you might have to tell me to shut up. I love Founders Institute. So Founder Institute is a pre-seed accelerator. So an accelerator is a program for startups that does exactly what it says. The idea is to basically say, okay, you don't know what you're doing. That's okay. We've looked at what startups do to be successful. We know what startups need to accomplish in their first, you know, 30, 60, 90, 120 days, whatever. So by enrolling in this program, we're going to set you on the straight and narrow and, and really kind of crack the whip, so to speak, to, to make sure it gives you sort of that, that, that peer group incentive, right? To, to stay on track, you know, get your reports in, you know, and have accomplishments that you can, you can speak to. So it's very motivating in that respect the same way that say college is motivating with grades and deadlines you know um so the idea is basically you know to take take a process that can take six months to a year without guidance and condense it down into two or three months um now most startups accelerators um focus on a particular age range of the startup right pardon me that's right around i would say pre-seed up to seed founder institute is one of very few, the only one that I'm aware of at this scale, that's um, very, very early stage. So we'll bring people in who don't have a startup, they have an idea, and they want to go dip their feet in the water and figure out if the startup is right for them, all the way up to the folks who are getting ready to raise their PC. And that's, that's kind of our window. So, so um, Levi, can you be too late to apply for Founders Institute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you're at a point where you've got several employees, and maybe, you know, you've already raised some, some substantial capital, maybe you're raising a seed round, and you've already raised pre-seed, there's a good chance, there are exceptions, but there's a good chance you might actually be too, too mature for Founder Institute, at which point we maintain you know, strong relationships and networks with other uh, startup related organizations, investors, whatnot. So here in Seattle, for example, we'll often refer people to uh, uh, Techstars, which is an excellent accelerator. A lot of our top graduates will actually go into Techstars right after because the two programs mesh really well. We are very much, if a program, if a, if a startup, excuse me, is, is really appropriate for Founder Institute, they are not ready for Techstars. If they're appropriate for Techstars, they're too mature for Founder Institute. There's really no overlap. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's really great. You know, in our case, if, if a startup is, is too mature for us, not really a problem. There's a, there's a wealth of resources available for them, right? If they're appropriate for us, there aren't that many. There, aren't, there just aren't that many resources available. One of the reasons, the big reasons I joined FI and I've stayed involved with it for so long is just because the organization is really well run very organized, it's very professional. Um, things are very standardized. It's also got a really strong focus, even though it's very much, you know, an accelerator for venture-backed or ideally soon to be venture-backed startups, right? Profit motivated. It's got a really strong social impact aspect as well. Um, startups are asked, for example, to align their uh, models and, and products with uh, some of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as part of the application process. Um, you know, there's, there's a very strong ethos of uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion and social impact throughout the program, which is something I appreciate a good deal. Um, but overall, just, just the, the execution of it, the organization, the kinds of mentors that we get in, it's just, it's, everything is held to a very high standard, which I really, really enjoy. Um, so, you know, it's super cool. And getting to work with startups at that early stage, for me, frankly, it's one of the most rewarding parts of my career. It's so much fun because you're working with people who have deep expertise in whatever they're doing typically um need a lot of help in other areas which is is fine uh, i mean it's great right that's that's why we're there and uh they're really passionate about what they're doing right like that's why they're in this space they, they've got something that they're excited about and that level of excitement and passion is just it's contagious in the best possible way you know it's incredibly energizing work in that environment um so i love it and and on top of that like the, the founders themselves really cool people, you know, like from all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of experiences. What they have in common is that they are driven, very intelligent, very capable, and have deep levels of expertise 
in you know whatever subject matter area that they're they're trying to move forward in. And so I, I always kind of laugh at the end of a cohort because I'll have a couple founders who will you know I've just clicked really well with who maybe needed the marketing experience, which is my forte. You know, and they'll they'll say, oh, you know, thank you so much for the help and blah blah blah. You know, we've learned so much, and I always kind of laugh because I'm like, invariably, I always feel like I've walked away learning way more from our founders than anything I've, I always feel kind of guilty. Like they've, they've given a lot more to me than I've contributed. I know it's a little bit uh, cliche to say that, but it's genuinely true. You, you can't sit in an environment of, you know, 10 to 20 you know, brilliant, motivated experts in their field and not walk away with a lot more than you started with, you know? So I know what accelerators like tech stars are coming here. They give you like a certain amount of money to, and to take equity, but Founder Institute has a different method for that, right? A little bit, yeah. So there is there is a fee for the program, although we offer a lot of fellowships and scholarships. Because the idea here, and this is something I believe really strongly in, is that you know th that's all for basically the operational cost of running the program. What we really want it to be as accessible as possible. Um, and so if someone's coming forward, you know, and, and they can't afford it, we really, at least in the Seattle chapter, we really bend over backwards to try and make it worth it if we can. Um, that, that's something that's really important. And so you said Seattle chapter. So there's like chapters across the United States, across the world. Across the world, uh, we've got. There's something like 200 chapters now globally. Um, yeah, all around the world. Super cool, which is another cool benefit, right? I've got networks now in, you know, Senegal, Lebanon, China, um, all through Europe, all through the U.S., North America, Latin America, right? Just through Founder Institute. And then each cohort actually gives up like 1% of the company to everyone else in the cohort, correct? Yeah, so it's, uh, so they just changed the equity model. And I have, I know there's less equity. I think it's 2.5% now for the program. It used to be 4%. Um, and so I, I think, Broadly, the model is pretty comparable. I have to confess, I'm not super familiar with it yet because we haven't run a co. My my our chapter in Seattle hasn't run a cohort since they changed the model, so I haven't really dived into the details. But the previous model, it was four percent, but it's not given up front. The the it's about two thirds of the way through the program was when companies then committed to the equity component, and they could choose to drop out at that point if they didn't want to commit to the equity component. Again, I know that the timeline here in the process has changed, but just to give you an idea of the kind of the thinking behind it. And then that 4%, some portion, I think it was 1% 1, 1 goes back to Founder Institute as part of like, you know, operational costs. 1% uh, goes to the local leadership team. So that would be, you know, myself and my colleague. Uh, then 1% went to um, the mentors. I think I have these numbers right. Big apologies if I don't. But like I said, it's changed anyway, so I guess it's irrelevant. Anyway, the remaining portion then uh, went to a pool, which is then divided among all the founders of the cohort who graduate. So you're giving up a portion of your equity, but you're you're buying it. Well, not buying it, but you're gaining a share of a pool that includes equity. From so, so you hope you get some high qualified cohort members with your Absolutely. cohort. Absolutely. But what I really love about it is what it does is it incentivizes the local leadership team, because we now hold an equity stake in your business. Um, it incentivizes the mentors because they now hold an equity stake in your business. So, to, you know, to keep keep involved after after graduation. But what's really cool about it is it really incentivizes your cohort to stay together because now you all have a literal, you're literally invested in one another's success. Um, and one of the things I've heard from a lot of graduates is that, you know, a few months after they go, you know, I'm so glad for that, that component, the share among the, the cohort, because it just, it really maintains that cohesiveness, you know, um, that that's definitely something that we really want to foster. So one of the priorities um, I know that HQ has been talking about, and certainly priority for myself, is improving our ability over the course of this next year or two uh, to really um, uh, maintain the, the FI network globally for, for our alumna, alum, alumna, right? alumni, excuse me, alumni, um, for our alumni, for our mentors, for investors, um, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's, because you look at accelerators like uh, Techstars, for example, and they've got an entire, you know, uh, uh, platform for networking, right? You, you create an account once you graduate, you sign into it, you can access all kinds of resources. And we don't have anything quite as formal yet. It's, it's more informal. And so starting to build that out, I think, is, is going to be one of the top priorities going forward. So that's a ton of value. And we both know Robert Wright, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and do you know Candace Dietz? Candace Dietz? She, she had come to us, give a space. She had a founder institute. Oh, Candace, Candace. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know Candace really well. Yeah, she's wonderful. So I know them. The other day, so I never went to the institute, founder institute, but they went through. I know other people went through. And basically, I'll say the same thing. Like, it's, it's not a joke, right? Like, you can't be mentally weak. You got to come, you, you sit together, right? Yeah. Like, I'm, of course, not going to be rude or unprofessional, but if your pitch is like kind of bad, you're going to be told it's kind of bad, right? So it's, yeah. not, it's not for the weak minded, right? Can you yeah. talk about that somehow? Like, you actually tell people, no. Maybe this isn't for you. And, and I think a lot of people need to hear that. 
Yeah, I mean, so it's it's a fine tightrope to walk, right? We we don't want to. We're never going to like you know, kick someone out for not having a great pitch or something. If they're not doing the work, we're going to have a chat with them, right? If you don't complete the assignments and everything, you're not going to be allowed to graduate. Um, it really wouldn't be fair to the founders who did put in the work, right? Um, and also means you're not getting anything out of the program. But you know, if someone's really putting in the effort and they're trying, we're we're going to bend over backwards to support them. I mean, Jeremy, my my colleague, and myself, and Lainey, my other colleague, helping run this chapter. You know, we'll have, we all have stories of, you know, two hour calls with founders being up till 10 o'clock at night, helping someone go over their pitch again and again, because they're going to be talking to an investor tomorrow, right? Like, it's very much a labor of love, right? Um, and we really... And this is not, so people know, this is not your full-time job. This is like your volunteer, no, this like this, like, like, yeah. So there, there is a small stipend associated um, to the local leaders. Uh, I forget, I forget what it is. It comes out to for the entire 14 week term. It's not not why you're doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it really is, it really is for fun. And, and of course, the equity stake is like, these are such early stage companies, the majority are going to go through so many iterations, they might not be the same company, many of them, the founders say, and th this is actually the, what I was referencing about the tightrope to walk, we're getting, we're getting founders in at such an early stage that a lot of these founders, they're really using FI, and we encourage this to decide if, if this is even the right path for them right now. So what we don't want to do is make it difficult for someone to leave the program. Right. If you get a few weeks in and you go, you know what, I can't balance this, these requirements, this is a lot of intensity. Many, many founders will say, uh, I still want to do this, but now is not the right time for me. You know, I just had a kid or whatever, I just started a new job. I thought I could do both, but now I'm feeling it's not right. A few cases will have founders go, you know what, my idea is not good. I'm going to go back and rework it, come back later. But in any of those cases, we want to make it super easy. And so typically what we do, the, there's a very generous refund for the there's a thousand dollar course fee, 800 if they sign up early. And like I said, lots of fellowships and whatnot available. There's a, several weeks in, you can still get a full refund if you leave. And even after that, at any point, if you leave, even if you don't get a refund, you don't have to pay to re-enroll in the, in the future. So we really want to make it very, very easy for people to uh, to drop out if they feel it's not right for them. You know, and, and you see this in the cohorts, like we'll typically start with 20, 24 people and maybe see six, six startups graduate. That, that's a pretty successful term um, for us. And you know that's that's really to be expected. We're all very very early stage, um, so you know at the same time we want people to feel supported and encouraged, and we want them to stay in the program, right? We just don't want to make it difficult for them to leave if they decide it's not right for them. So average cohort starts for twenty five, end with six. The nineteen leave, they like self selected leave, or you tell them you might want to leave. How does that work? I I've been doing this what, I think three four years now. I have not had a single founder that we've pushed out ever. Um, you know, we'll occasionally have to send a slightly strongly worded note to say, hey, you've got three weeks of homework over two, and if you don't get it together, we can't graduate you. We've had a couple of those, but um, we've never actually, you know, had to tell someone they could, could or at least not since I've been here, we've, we've never told someone they were going to leave. So, Levi, when someone graduates, what's the benefit of someone graduating? What are the, what's the advantage of that? So, like I mentioned, we've got, you know, networks of investors and, and advisors and whatnot, so that, you know, having successfully completed an FI chapter, um, an FI program, I should say, is definitely a feather in your cap. It adds some legitimacy. Uh, there's also the benefit that going through the entirety of the program means that you develop strong relationships with a lot of mentors. In many cases, many of those mentors become the first members of your advisory board. Um, you know, like I said earlier, at the end of every cohort, I have a couple startups that will ask me to join an advisory board if we clicked really well. Um, so that's really powerful. You now have access to the FI network, even though it's not as you know formalized as some of the other accelerators like I was mentioning, it, it still is something that exists and there are resources available, you know, to take advantage of that. Um, we also have now, uh, FI has, has sort of hived off a separate organization um, to run a very similar program for launching new venture capital funds. Um, and so of course there's an obvious, you know, relationship and synergy there. So you gain access to a lot of those folks too. And is that the loyal VC? A loyal VC is a separate thing. Separate uh, thing, okay. Is, uh, we'll we'll talk about that later then. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk about loyal as well. Um, but uh, but loyal would be a great example of you know part of that network that you gain access to. And loyal because of their model and this is their decision. They're not you know um, they're they're not affiliated at like a corporate level with FI. It's it's purely you know sort of a partnership thing. But um, you know their primary deal flow is coming from FI. So as a graduate, you now become eligible for for their fund. For uh, according to their own policy. Um, so, you know, a lot of benefits in that respect, I would say. Um, and then, of course, there's other programs that FI offers. There's the Funding Lab, for example, which is a, I think it's a one-week program. I've heard from a lot of people that it's incredibly intense. Um, but that's for folks, you know, getting ready to kind of start seeking institutional funding. 
as, as a kind of a, a boot camp getting ready for that. Um, you know, so there's different resources like that that are available. But I would say ultimately, you know, the, the core benefit really ought to be the, the learning that you get out of the program itself. And really everything else is, is kind of coming after that. And you'll actually type application for next cohort pretty soon, aren't you? Yeah, I think, I think applications are open now. We're actually starting to run recruiting events already. We have March 30th, we have an event coming up. Um, and uh, then we have another one April 16th, I want to say. You can go to fi.co. Um, just make sure your location set to Seattle in the upper right-hand corner, and you can see all the events coming up. And then my colleagues, Jeremy, Lainey, and myself, you know, share it on LinkedIn all the time as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the March 30th one coming up, I think, promises to be pretty good. We're going to have some investors and founders on the panel you know, sharing some advice uh, about their own experiences and advice for new founders. So in the past, what, how many average applications have you had for a cohort? Gosh, um, in terms of overall applications, you know, honestly, it varies really wildly. It's, it's, it's hard to say average because of COVID kind of throwing a wrench in the works. Because like for some of the cohorts, as they were virtual, we were admitting anyone from around the world. So obviously that expansion pool. So definitely in the neighborhood of a few dozen applications at a minimum, I would say. And then typically we see around, like I said earlier, maybe 20-ish uh, founders accepted into a cohort. Um, and then just because, you know, Jeremy, Laney, and myself are the three on the local team here. We don't like to go too, too much bigger than that because- you know, Is the all three decide who gets in, so to speak? Uh, it's, it's in close partnership with HQ. So the okay. process is run through FIHQ as well. So we have a, they, they'll develop an opinion and they'll do like a first screen. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole, uh, you know, application process and like a, a personality test that the, the founders can take. And so there's certain things there that can just immediately kind of red flag and people get filtered out right off the bat. Um, and then uh, after that, that's the, that's the point. Once that first first sort of course filter has happened, that's that's usually when you know we come in as a local team and start to kind of mm -hmm. have more of a, a direct involvement in the application or the admissions process. Yes. And then, so your early stage, is there like a sweet spot? Like there's like a perfect startup, like they have a certain amount of traction, certain amount of technical skills, like there's like some kind of sweet spot that, you, that you're looking for? Um, I'd say, we're more looking to make sure the startup isn't too mature, to okay. be honest, because um, there is a certain point, you know, where, and those folks will usually churn out, but ultimately it, it kind of, you know, they're kind of walking away going, oh, this is a waste of our time if that happens, right? Yeah. So we really want to avoid that happening. That's the biggest thing. Um, there isn't really such a thing as too early, right? Like I said earlier, and this is very true, we, we typically, any cohort, we have at least a couple people coming in that they're, they're literally like, I have not quit my job. I do not have a corporation set up. I have an idea and I want to see how this goes, right? And that's it. And that's great, right? We welcome that. Um, in the past couple of years, we've developed two different tracks. Um, there's the growth track and the, oh gosh, I can't remember what the other one's called. <laughs> but basically the idea is that one, one track, Founders World in one track, they get, the assignments are slightly tweaked and it's really more for startups that are like ha absolute starting from zero. And then the other the other track is really more for startups that are you know have started to do a little bit, started to make an effort, maybe done some customer discovery, maybe they even have a beta of their product, whatever, and they're really thinking more about you know kind of step two, mm -hmm. so to speak. Anyone past that point, we're probably going to be referring them to another accelerator that's more suitable for their where they're at. Um, I will say that you know coming in, you definitely want to come in with some expectation that the workload is going to be required and be prepared to dedicate the time. I think on the website say twenty hours a week minimum. I think what it said. I think that's probably the estimate. If, if, if and it might even be more, right? Depending on, you know, we we've had some founders, for example, who will come in and maybe they just really are uncomfortable pitching or have no experience doing it. Or in many cases, maybe that's not the issue, but what they're trying to pitch is so different, unusual, and complex that their pitch just requires a ton of work. And those folks, I strongly suspect, put in quite a lot more than twenty hours a week in practice. And often you'll see the really dedicated founders. They'll be setting up time every week with me, with Jeremy, with Laney, with our mentors, practicing that pitch over and over again. Um, I love working with those founders. The founders who come in and they're just struggling with the pitch, but they really have the, the drive. Some of my favorite founders to work with because you watch as they just blossom. We had we had one, I don't want to name names because I don't have permission, but we had a founder last cohort who was coming in and not based in Seattle. And they uh, they had such a fascinating business model, I thought kind of involved in the social impact uh, investment sector. And uh, it was it was very complex and it was hard to land. And, and this individual had, you know, just really good like presence, uh, you know, with the presentation, but when, once they got over their nerves, 
um, and a really good uh, uh, sort of prioritization of narrative structure in the pitch. But they were just really struggling to land the important bits in a way that was clear and concise, right? And I felt so bad because, you know, they'd come in, they'd pitch to the mentors, the mentors would say, oh, you should do ABC. And then they come in next week, pitch to the next set of mentors, and those mentors would give contradicting advice, right? And they were trying to find this middle ground. And I'll tell you what, by the time we got to the end of the cohort, this person's pitch was one of the best pitches I think I've ever seen. I was like, I was getting slightly emotional at the end. I was like, how far you've come, you know? And it was just fantastic to watch. And it's, it's so cool because, you know, and I'm focusing on pitches just because that's a huge part of the program. And at this very early stage, I think it's helpful for a lot to revolve around the pitch because you're trying to get people on board, whether those are investors, employees, whomever, but also getting a really good, clear, concise pitch, it, it helps, it's got a sort of knock-on effect, right? Where it helps the person think about what they need to prioritize. If their go-to-market strategy and their pitch is unclear, doesn't make sense, and they're getting critique about it, and they, they're communicating it clearly, that's a good sign their go-to-market strategy needs some work. It's not the pitch's fault, it's you know, that they need, they need work there. So it gives them a sense of what to prioritize and what to work on. Um, so I think that's really helpful. But getting that pitch nailed early on, you know, it's, and I'm seeing this now as a co-founder of my, my own startup, it's so, so critical, it's so important. So it's really gratifying, you know, we see over and over again that our graduates, um, you know, in the Seattle area where I have firsthand experience, because I active in some investor groups here too, they come in and they, they win pitch competitions, you know, they, they, they come first in, in uh, you know, different, different um, investment events where pitches are being evaluated, you know, they get really positive feedback just really consistently, you can see where the practice pays off. Um, and that leads to future successes down the road, right? It's, it's, a, it's a really good foundation to, to start things off on. Yeah, I'm a big believer that pitch decks and resume is kind of the same, right? If you give your resume to 25 people, you got 25 opinions. Give your pitch deck to 20 people, you're going to get 25 different opinions, I think. And that's one of the values, right? Because, you know, your average founder getting those opinions is super valuable. You want those opinions from many different people, and ideally people that are not friends and family who kind of feel obligated to be nice, right? Um, and we've got some mentors who I can tell you firsthand, they're there to help, but they do not feel obligated to be nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a good mix to have. You don't need anyone who's going to be rude or mean or anything. I'm not saying that. But just folks who can go, you know, hey, that that didn't make sense. You know, like, there's no other way for me to put that didn't make sense. And here's what I think you need to do to try and make this make sense, right? I, I posted on LinkedIn a while back and had some really great conversations with folks about one of, one of our mentors, Raj Mabad who does this thing that I really love when a when Yeah, founder, I, I saw that. Yeah, founder will give a pitch and you kind of sitting there going, oh, I didn't get that, was it just me? And Raj will go, you know, so-and-so in the audience, tell me what they- Hey, us get up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You know, he'll, he'll pick someone random in the audience and they'll say, can you tell me what, what their product is about? And it's not, you know, it's not meant to be antagonistic. It's not like a awesome. gotcha, catchy or- Yeah, it's not a gotcha. He's just illustrating the point, right? Because he can say, I didn't understand that, but he'll pick someone else and they'll go, oh, well, you know, I, I get this is their audience and they're trying to solve this problem. And he'll go, okay, and how are they going to do that? And he'll, they'll go, oh, I don't really know. And then he'll go back to the founder and he'll say, okay, so you see, those are the points you landed. These are the points you didn't, right? And here's my opinion on why that happened and how you can correct it. And I always find, I think it's such a wonderfully constructive and non-antagonistic, non-aggressive way to land that point in a really clear, nine times out of 10, the founder will go, you can see them. They go, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, you know? It just really lands it. And that founder will come back next week. Their pitch will be so much better, yeah. like really consistently. Um, so I, I'm, you know, that that kind of thing and those kinds of insights. And then again, talking about my own personal learnings, right? I walk away from that. I go, wow, that was a really cool idea, Raja. You know what I mean? I'm stealing that. I'm going to go do that now. Do it with my own pitches, you know? So here's a question for you. Let's suppose you have one slot left in FI. You have two companies. Yeah. They're pretty much both the same level, right? Same metrics, same whatever. But one company has been working on it for three years. Other one has only been there for three months. Does one have an advantage over the one based on time, work done, or anything like that? That's an interesting point. I think what I'd have to get into, you know, my my knee jerk response would be I'm kind of leaning towards the three month one, um, but I'd want to understand a little bit better because we we've got a lot, you know, where I'll talk to that one that's been working on it for three years, and it's because it started off as a side project, no intent to move it into a startup. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe this person is a really common one. You know, you might have a founder who took time off to take care of a new child. Yeah, or right? a family emergency or, or family something came up or illness. dad spent money on something un unforeseen. Exactly. So they've been working on this side project, right? And now they're at a point where maybe life circumstances have changed or their priorities have changed. Something's happened where they go, or maybe they're just going, holy crap, I'm getting way more traction on this than I thought. And when you know what? I'm going to try and make this a real startup. You know, that's a great narrative. 
And then even though, like, I'm a big thing, like, if your spouse doesn't support you, it's a hard thing, too. So maybe the three-year person, yeah. his spouse, like, no, you can't work full-time. You got to keep a job until this point, too. You yeah, know? that's absolutely something you can see, too. Um, yeah, so there's tons of stuff like that. Or in some cases, what you see is it was a side project, and now the person did have a child and decided, you know what, I'm going to step back from my career, take care of this child. But as a result, I actually have now this time you know, a startup can fit into it because their, their time is now, you know, sporadically available. Mm-hmm. They can't commit, you know, an eight or 10 hour block to a day job and also take care of their, their baby, but they can commit those eight hours broken out over the course of the day on their own time. Yeah. And so they want to do a startup. Like to me, that's, that's fantastic. I think that's super cool. Um, so, you know, I think it really depends on the circumstances. Now, at the same time, you have founders who, you know, they'll come in and, and maybe they're just not, as committed to it, right? Mm-hmm. This is a passion project. They're doing something for fun, but it's at a point where they've done 10 hours a week on it for three years and you get to talk with them and they're really not going to do more than 10 hours mm-hmm. a week for the next three years either. FI is probably not the right, yeah. right place for that person, right? Um, or an accelerator in general might not be the right place for that person, right? This is really for something for people who want to dive into this full time. Yeah. And so, another, another point too, like maybe the three month, you know, team, they have a the tech co-founder, they're all connected. They know people in the startups for the right. three year one. He had to learn code himself. He had That's like, a great you know, point. That's he had to learn the code point. himself, all that kind of stuff, you know. Exactly. So if I've got that three-month person coming in and they're going, oh, well, you know, I'm friends with this guy with a family office. They dropped four million in and we're just off to the races and running. Okay, cool. And maybe I talk to that three-year person and they go, I'm a college dropout. I've been building my career in tech, scrounging up enough money to do this on the side. And I finally saved up enough that I can commit full-time. Oh, I'm, I'm taking that person. Like yeah. that is grit. That's grit on grit, right? That's what I want to see, that level of perseverance and determination. Not any kind of a knock against the person in the three-month mm-hmm. position. But if I have to pick between those two people, the person who's proven that they're sticking with us despite hardship and despite mm-hmm. challenge for that long, that's that's someone I want to get to know better. And that's that's, that's someone I want in the group, right? So we have a next talk about, let's talk about angel investing that you do in the area and just like Seattle, Seattle fundraising in general. Yeah. Well, okay. So I should I should caveat this. You know, I just started investing myself what less than two years ago um i make the i made the accredited investor qualification by the skin of my teeth (laughs) and i'm not writing any big checks here um so seattle angel conference has been a godsend for me from that point of view because the the buy-in as a participant is very small and it's very structured right um i think it's a super cool program i was actually just talking with someone recently um i think it was an investor in san francisco actually and they were talking about how in the past few years, there's been such a ballooning of the Seattle startup ecosystem and investment ecosystem. And I genuinely think a lot of that is probably down to the Seattle Angel Conference, right? Because this is a program that's just churning out investors yeah. and helping startups understand how to bring a, 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 a higher level of professionalism. Yeah, I, I definitely think COVID helped that out too. Kind of yeah. John went like virtual, so to speak. I think a yeah. couple of years ago, Jerry Yin from the Vice Analytics one from San Diego. That was my first. You know, that yeah. would never happen before. So I think that that was a really big help, you know. Yeah, so that was my first uh, Seattle Angel Conference was the one with the Vice Analytics. Um, yeah, and it's, it's fantastic, right? Because you gain, as an investor, you or an aspiring investor, you learn so, so much going through that program, right? You get to watch the do's and don'ts of due diligence and understand what people look for. And it's super helpful for the entrepreneurs too, both the entrepreneurs going through the startup or through the program, but even if you're entering the program as an investor, it's helpful for you as a founder as well, because you get to see the discussion that happens between the investors, right? Um, and you also get to see some of the differences between the new investors and the more experienced investors, right? And, and the, the different ways they think about things. Um, so I think there's a huge advantage there. I also really like it because, you know, a lot of founders will tell you, this is kind of a joke that the smaller the check an investor's bringing, the more of a pain in the ass they're going to be for you. Yeah. I've heard that a lot. I think it can often be true. And I strongly suspect that there's a correlation because if it's a smaller check, it's someone who can't afford as much. They're a little more precious about their money. And also there's a good chance they're a less experienced investor and they're going to be a little bit more paranoid and maybe have an overinflated idea of their own value. Um, just hypothesizing here, definitely not based on personal experience. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, with the Seattle angel conference, I think it's really better for the founders because as investors, we're all sort of corralled and, you know, good behavior is enforced by, by John and, and, you know, the, the other organizers, which I think is really good. Um, so there's a lot of value there. And then, and then there's that assurance that, you know, you're going to get a wealth of feedback from the 
experience with the founder who's participating too, which is really nice because you know you often see you talk to VCs or angel groups and they just come back they go ah, we don't want to invest and you go, why not it's just radio silence right so you don't you don't really have a chance to improve or grow from that. But, so what's your opinion on this? So you hear a lot of founders in Seattle say, "I've been trying to get investment, I can't get any money from any VCs or angels." The angels and VCs, while we only we invest in, in companies that are you know uh, VC backed or whatever. Then a lot of these founders will go like the Bay Area, Austin, New York City, and get get investment after the case. It seems like there's a disconnect there. Yeah, I think it's it, you know it speaks to our our ecosystem here for investment. And, um, I have to admit that you know the the startup my startup Unimart. Um, so you know I'm I joined as sort of a late co-founder, um, and the the startup is headquartered in LA. It was originally founded, and the majority of the team still sits in, in Hyderabad, in India. Um, so we actually do not have very many investors at all from the Seattle area. So I have not had the benefit of experiencing the ecosystem here to any great extent as a founder, only to a minimal degree. Um, my sense is that, you know, you've got a lot of people in the space here who are you know, coming out of Microsoft, Amazon, what have you. They're very focused on cloud technology, B2B SaaS, um, AI is a big one. They often have some fairly fixed ideas, I think, about what is or is not feasible in those spaces. And I'm not I'm not personally, as a non-technical person myself, I'm not personally convinced that uh, some of those sort of shibboleths are always entirely accurate. Um, I think sometimes they're more limiting than they are beneficial, um, which can be problematic when it comes to you know innovation, right? You've got a really creative founder in one of the spaces, and you'll have a lot of people who are experts in those or, or similar spaces saying, oh, no, this isn't feasible or this isn't possible, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Then that same founder might go down to you know, San Francisco or Austin or off to the East Coast or something and find investors willing to give them a shot, get off to the races and running. And it turns out, you know what? Actually, it was possible, right? Um, actually, have a startup and FI grad that I strongly suspect is on track to fall into exactly that category with an AI based product right now. Um, but, uh, you know, so that, that can be a little bit limiting. It's just like how founders will tell you, you know, in LA, for example, the ecosystem is very focused around. D to C brands, e-commerce, consumer tech. Uh, New York, you see a lot of media and ad tech. Mm. Boston, you see a lot of you know health and biotech. New York fintech. Yeah, fintech New York as well. You're right. Now that's not to say that you know you you're not going to see you know an e-commerce SaaS company starting and getting funded and being successful in New York, or a health health tech biotech company getting funded successfully in San Francisco. You know these are just kind of general trends that that I think most people would agree are, are present. Um, so that's important as well. The other big thing I think you see in Seattle is our scene is much younger, right? So we have, I don't know the stats on it, but I strongly suspect you'd see that the average age of our VC funds here, the average size too, is significantly younger, significantly smaller. Yeah, and plus I think we're, for every one Seattle VC, there's like at least 50 in the Bay Area or some crazy that's number like that. true, yeah. So there's also just a numbers issue for sure. Um, but you know, if you're if you're a micro VC with a twenty million dollar pre seed fund, you're going to be very circumspect, right? It's you're going to be very cautious, and the checks you're writing, a, a, a company is probably going to need several of those checks to really get moving. Um, you, you go to a a larger ecosystem. I mean, look, if if you're if 0.1 percent of the investors out there are right for you, you know that might be three investors in Seattle and 20 investors in San Francisco, mm -hmm. right? I'm just making up numbers, obviously, but you know, it's just, if, if, if there's a small slice that's suitable for you, then a bigger pie means a bigger slice, right? So I, I strongly suspect that's probably a good part. Yeah, so I, I know a guy in the Bay Area, I can't think of his name to credit him, but we were talking about this one time, comparing Bay Area to Seattle. Yeah. His opinion was like in the Bay Area, all the investors have at least started a, a company before, like at least started mm -hmm. one startup, right? At least once they would deal. He was like, it's like most people in Seattle, like Amazon, Microsoft, that knew how to read a startup. He said the second part thing is the bigger deal is like in the Bay Area, Someone says, quote, unquote, makes it right. They sell a couple hundred million dollars. They always in, reinvest the money back in the Bay Area startups. Mm. He's like, I don't know if like Seattle startups do that when they, quote, unquote, make it. Are they really reinvesting back in the community, you know? That's a really interesting point. Um, my, my guess, and this is just a guess, is that historically that probably has not been true to the same extent as in San Francisco. And I think that's changing in the past few years. Um, again, just a guess. Uh, just, you know, based on my exposure to the ecosystem and what I've seen. Um, but it, you know, it's a it's a self fulfilling prophecy, right? It, it, or, or rather, it's a positive flywheel, right? You, you have more investors, more investment money being reinvested in the space. 
you're going to have more successful startups, right? Yeah. Launching, which means more investors going forward and, you know, you create a really, a, a virtuous cycle there, ideally. I think this is maybe my own optimism coming through, but I, I think that we're, we're in, we're in sort of, let's say stage two or four of a cycle like that right now, I, I think in Seattle, I mean. I think another challenge too for startup founders, like you come to my work, 12 million in San Francisco, but 6 million in Seattle, maybe 8 million in Austin, like every location you go, it's like a different valuation you have to do. Yeah. That, that, that can be challenging. And, you know, you've got, I, I think we're going to start seeing, I don't think we're quite seeing it yet, but we're going to start seeing some increasing ramifications of, you know, this turn towards remote work uh, affecting that, I strongly suspect. Um, but, you know, to some extent it's driven, I think, by supply and demand in, in terms of where the supply is deal flow, new investment opportunities. Right. And, uh, and the demand, of course, is, is, is uh, you know, those investment dollars um, or paid for by those investment dollars. So uh, I think where you have greater demand for that deal, deal flow, um, you, you are going to see higher prices, right? Pretty simple market economics. I mean, there's obviously more to it than that, but I, I do think that's one of the factors that goes into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally making this up, but sometimes like the Seattle investors, expect the A-round company for pre seed investment sometimes. What do you mean? Like, you know, if you're going to get, you get a pre seed investment, yeah. but then we have A-round metrics, right? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I think something like that is probably a can, yeah, you know, and you see this among, um, you know, newer investors, I think is this, this risk aversion that leads them to want. Yeah, are uh, you an investor or you're a small business banker? Exactly. See this some, like like I've had I've had experiences where you know we'll have a company pitching to some investors and you know the feedback afterwards will be well you know they, they don't have any revenue yet so uh, you know I don't feel comfortable investing well yeah I mean that's the stage you're at right like there is a stage at which the company isn't going to have revenue and you need to be comfortable with that risk and that's why you're going to get way more equity in the company for your dollar than you would if you invested after they have revenue because you're adopting that risk that's how it works so if you're not comfortable with that level of risk that's fine this investment stage is not right for you, right? But it's not fair to the company to call yourself, you know, an early stage or pre-seed investor, right? And then have requirements that that company needs to meet to be investable that are really more appropriate for a seed stage or even a series mm -hmm. A company, right? That's just, that's a mismatch. You're not gonna find, you're not gonna find the companies you're looking for at that stage. Um, and that's what I mean about, you know, educating investors and, and ensuring that they're, they know what they're doing and, and know how to interact with the startups and how to evaluate the startups at some level. Yeah, I, I know I was Bunko last like two and a half years. I ran the reservation program. It's based like via FI for military veterans. Oh, cool. And I, I want to say like, we had like 10 members for cohort. At least one member got funded each time. None of them got funded in Seattle. Hopefully I'm not wrong, but I know like one guy got angel investing from Atlanta, another one from there, all of wow. them. I can't think of one that got investing from Seattle, even though of course they, they tried hard to get here. They always went somewhere else. The ones who got funded always went somewhere else. Wow. I, I think another challenge I talk to people about like, you're a founder, you're in Seattle, you get your no. And you think that's it, right? Like maybe you went to somewhere else, you would have got funded, you know? Yeah. Like how many people give up? While well, Seattle told me, no, my, I, I can't get funded, that's it, right? You know, it's incredible the, the differences, you know, just, just region to region in terms of investment. And I, I've seen this um, with Unimart. Some of our investors are in the U.S. We've got, um, you know, investors uh, based outside the U.S. And we've got investors in India. So outside the U.S. is in not, not India, <laughs> uh, as well as the investors in India. And just watching the cultural differences in, in terms of um, what those investors are looking for, what they're worried about, what they'll take as sort of proof of traction or proof of success is wild between, between countries. And one of the things that's super interesting to see is how, you know, the, the investors who have a presence in India uh, value highly our substantial traction, Unimart's substantial traction in India. Investors based in U.S., they they'll, they'll they'll literally say to our face, you know, that they, they don't want to invest until we have traction. Like the fact that we have several hundred paying customers and tens of thousands in monthly recurring revenue coming out of India, it's like they forget it. That's like that's like that's like monopoly money. Yeah, it's super interesting. Now I completely get the argument, right? That that they want to see product market fit established in the U.S. and real traction here. It's just interesting in the language that there's no qualifier in the statement, right? They'll just say, oh, I want to see traction. Not I need to see traction in the U.S., right? It's just an interesting difference, I, I think, of, of uh, perspective. And, and then you similarly, you'll, you'll see with a lot of these VC funds that, you know, they, they often say, oh, you know, these are our parameters. We look for companies at this stage. These are our check sizes. This is the amount of equity we want, you know, and they'll have a lot of different requirements for what they look for. And 
I would say, you know, maybe 80% of the time, you really think about it. And, and those, those requirements, those, you know, differentiators and strategy um, between funds, they're really not, all, all it's really doing is narrowing down the bill flow, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a, it's a little bit like if you said, hey, I'm going to go on a diet and I'm not going to eat any foods that are red, right? Yeah, it's going to reduce what's available to you. It's going to limit your choices, which can often be easier. But there's no real connection to, you know, any kind of nutritional aspect, right? If you're removing foods by, say, color or by shape or what have you. And I feel like it's it's kind of similar to that with a lot of VCs. They, they have, you know, restrictions that they'll put on on the kinds of funds or the kinds of investment opportunities they're looking for. But it doesn't really have any impact on potential success or anything. It's just the parameters they've chosen to put in place. Now, that said, the other 20%, you see some VCs that really are genuinely doing, and this isn't a criticism, right? There's a model that works. If that's the model you're following, great, more power to you, that's fine. But there's some VCs that are looking at this and going, you know, no, we want to do something different and adopting a really truly different model. And Loyal would be one of those, I would say. Uh, Mighty Capital is another really cool one. Um, Overlooked Ventures is one I'm personally very interested in. I don't have a direct connection to them, but um, you know, the, these are VC funds. They're all pretty new, usually founded within the past, say, three to four years. And they're trying out really new, innovative, different models of investment and engagement. And uh, I think that's very exciting, personally. It's really cool to see. Yeah, back to diversity real fast. You'll see, like, I'll yeah. see it all the time. Like, these VC will say, we want to invest in diversity, whatever case may be. Yeah. And the small note, we only do email introductions from people where you know. Exactly, like, right? What? Are, 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 you, are, are you serious right now? Exactly. And that's a, that's a cool thing Overlook Ventures does, actually. They won't, they don't do warm intros. They're not interested. They say, if you want, you want to pitch to them, everybody has to go through the same intake process, mm -hmm. application process, right? Because they don't want to create that kind of, you know, bias in their process, which I have a ton of respect for. I think that's, that's really, really impressive. Loyal does sort of takes the, the opposite approach, right? They, they say our deal flow comes, they, they have three ways the deal flow comes in. Uh, an FI, the main way is an FI graduate that's recommended by the director of that chapter as, as a top alum. Second way is uh, other INSEAD alums because the, the two GPs are, are INSEAD alums. And then the third way is if a, an investor, uh, an, a limited partner who has more than a certain amount invested in the fund uh, gets, gets a credit. I think it's a credit for every $100,000 you have invested, something like that. And you can use that credit to recommend one company to be invested in by the fund. And then they'll do their due diligence. And if everything checks out, they'll invest, regardless of whether there's an INSEAD or FI connection. And that's it. And so, you know, obviously you can look at that and say, well, there's some bias there, right? In say, add right off the top of my head. But um, I think what they what they do is they're basically they're 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 trying to create a sort of an objective structure, right? And and a, and and it creates a it makes it much much easier to apply an object an objective framework to evaluation of a of a of a startup for investing, right? It's kind of the the other side of the coin from say the approach that a company like or a fund like Overlook Ventures takes. So, you know, both of those are very new funds. Uh, I, I don't know about Overlook Ventures uh, uh, numbers to date. I'm not an LP there, but I am an LP with Loyal. And I can say that, you know, it's, I think it's they've been very successful to date. It's, it's been really impressive. I'm very glad to be part of the fund. And I'm really excited to see what the next few years hold with that model. So we're startups. So for this question, I'm not talking about when like a startup reaches out, a founder reaches out to a VC to start networking and build a relationship. But do you see, think that most founders or startups start the fundraising process way too soon? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I would make that statement, to be honest. Um, I think one thing that I do see among earlier stage founders that I would say when it comes to funding is um, they, there's often this belief that they have to seek outside funding. And one of the biggest questions I get from very early stage founders in FI and outside of it is, do I need VC funding, right? And I'll talk to them and I'll, I'll say, well, you know, what are you going to use the money for? And a lot of times the answer I get is, oh, I, I don't really know. We don't really need it. So you, you probably go. don't need it. Yeah. You don't need VC funding. But I think there's just this idea that VC funding is so closely associated with startups that some founders who don't have, you know, exposure to the space previously kind of go, oh, I must be missing something. I have to get VC funding or I'm not a real startup. Then you hear all the, the, all the hype, you know, so this company raised $2.5 million or yeah. whatever case would be. But I think the stats, I'm making this up again, even with VC funding, only like 10% or even less even make it, you know. Like yeah. what's that company last year? I think it was called Quibi had like $5 million of yes. funding. Oh, it was, I think it was more than that actually. Yeah. That, that and they felt like crazy. six months is like, yep. And then they just completely imploded. Um, yeah. And that's a great example. I've been talking about that particular company a lot lately. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's true. I mean, it's, it's a case of cherry picking your success metrics, right? 
um, you know, as a startup, there's so many ways you could look at it because it's so subjective. There's, there's no market cap to evaluate, right? If you're still growing with revenue, you can't really evaluate profits because you're not profitable, right? So do you look at the extent of your loss? That's not really a, a viable metric either. Maybe our loss, our loss was less this quarter versus the last quarter. Yeah, exactly. Right. You could look at headcount. Are you growing? Okay, great. But maybe you're hiring irresponsibly. That doesn't really tell me anything. Um, and so, you know, what's become a, a popular vanity metric is money raised and valuation. Right. But, you know, those, those are also like, frankly, I, I don't care what your money raised or your valuation was. I want to know what your term sheet looks like. Right. If, if I'm going to be investing or considering joining a startup. If you've got a terrible term sheet, if you've got liquidation multiples and, you know, you've given up like preferred, uh, preferred stock really early on and, you know, you're, you don't have a lot of equity left for the founder or all kinds of stuff, you know, yeah, you might have a several hundred million dollar valuation. You've raised a bunch of money, but your terms suck. You're not going to be walking away with anything as a founder. I had an, an experience when I was at Esade, we I had this really good class. Um, it was called Entrepreneurial Finance, taught by Dr. Luisa Alemani, who's in charge of a... Um, an entrepreneurial, um, uh, 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 not program, but a, a new institute at, um, I think it's at London Business School actually. Um, and she, she published a book a year or two ago on entrepreneurial finance in Europe. That's really, really a fantastic read as well. Um, and she gave us this example uh, in the class where, where she, she laid out you know what looked like a really great fundraise for a startup. And then she had a hypothetical term sheet, term sheet, which admittedly was probably a lot worse than you would see in real life, but it was definitely within the bounds of possibility. And then she ran the numbers, like walked us through the numbers of in the event of what would by any standard be a very successful exit for this hypothetical startup based on the term sheet and the last funding round, here's how the equity distribution would break down. And what it broke down to was for a startup that sold at something like, you know, half a billion dollars and the the founder was walking away with double digit equity percent. And then it ultimately worked out that the founder left with like 10 grand, something like that, right? Like almost no money at all. And she was just showcasing how the different terms, if they were unfavorable to the founder, how it could compound and end up with the founder, even in the case of a like explicitly, like objectively successful exit, the founder walks away with borderline nothing. Um, that really made an impression on me because <laughs> I, I had no idea at the time, right? And I, I think something like that, you know, I often talk with founders about that. They get really hung up on the amount raised and the valuation. I say, look, you've got to pay attention to the term sheet. Familiarize yourself with what's standard practice right now in your area for terms. Make sure you have a lawyer on board. Like, be prepared going in. Know what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and, and get familiar with this. There are resources out there, but if you're in the middle of a negotiation with a VC fund and you've got a week to decide, it is not enough time to ramp yourself up to the level that you need if you don't already have a good lawyer helping you, you know? That's one of the many things the entrepreneur has to get smart on, right? It is, yeah. You have to be an expert in so many spaces. It's it's dizzying, right? And I think one of the things that a founder needs to be capable of, and this is a skill that I am still attempting to master, is recognizing when you're, you kind of have to apply the Pareto principle, I feel like, to uh, to to your level of expertise, right? What What is the 20% of knowledge that you can get that gives you 80% of the benefit, so to speak? Um, you have to get comfortable with this idea that something needs to be good enough and you, you have to develop the skill or, or I think it's very beneficial to develop the skill of being able to dive into a new topic, prioritize exactly the elements of that topic you need to understand, like, like in, invest, investing in startups, for example, right? As a founder, you don't really need to understand how to do due diligence, even though that would be considered a foundational kind of, a, you know, a, 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 a flagstone of learning how investment, startup investment works. But that's not what's important to you right now. You need to understand how VCs are evaluating you, how the term sheet works, how the investment process works, what the terminology is. It's really important to know the language. There's a ton of ton of jargon. The concepts behind that jargon are not complicated. But if you don't know the jargon, you come across as ignorant, right? And you don't want to come across as ignorant. So it's really good to get up to speed on on the jargon of, of you know the, the startup investment community um, for that exact reason. And so really being able to kind of whoops, sorry, go really deep on particular sort of subtopics within a subject get the information you need, pull back out and apply it is this is a very critical skill, I think, as a, as a founder. Like I said, one I'm still working on. But <laughs> Yes. So next, let's talk about your, your startup on now. So, yeah. so first, we have is this. So the company started in 2017, I think. Yeah. But you just joined as a co-founder. Correct. I think a lot of people think you're only a co-founder if you join like within the first two or three months. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about how that's, that's really a myth and, you know, anyone become, become a co-founder? Yeah, definitely. I, I think at this point, you know, co-founder is really... Um, 
it is indicative of your role within the company, right? Um, and so it's the intent is to imply that you're at a kind of a foundational level in terms of your responsibility for ensuring that the company continues to exist. Um, and I think what's really important there is to understand that you can be a co-founder without necessarily being a C-suite executive in the startup, right? Uh, it is entirely possible as our company grows that I may find myself in a position where, you know, I, we want to bring in an expert CMO, for example, to lead the company. And that might be someone I work with, but I'm not in a C-suite role with that person because if we're fortunate enough, maybe we land someone who's really got substantial expertise and accomplishments in that space. And that's the person that we want to lead in our marketing strategy, right? Absolutely a possibility. Um, and then, you know, there's this idea of the, the late co-founder as well, which is how I've described my position with respect to Unimart. It's something I came across not long ago, and I, I thought that was a clever term. I don't know if it's an official term or not, but I think it's a good description. Um, and I think this is something you often see more when the startup has had uh, a major shift of some kind. You know, you see this with something like Tesla, for example. People often refer to Elon Musk as the founder of Tesla. That's actually not true. It came in significantly later. Um, the, the original, I think, two co-founders uh, left the company, I want to say on good terms, but don't quote me on that, and Musk took over and transformed it into the Tesla that we know today. And so I think by any, by any reasonable you know, assessment, you'd have to call him a co-founder for that reason. But he wasn't there at the initiation of the company. He joined later. Very similar situation with Uber and Travis Kalanick, for example, same deal. Um, I think if you dig into a lot of larger successful tech firms, you'll actually find that this is frequently the case. Um, in our case, you know, Unimart started in 2017, as you mentioned, and it originally was more service oriented uh, while the product platform was being built out um, because the, the platform that we're leveraging is very complex, very big project. Um, so the idea was to start generating some revenues and proof of concept of the idea before the product was necessarily ready. Um, and then just about when the product was going to be launched, um, COVID really threw a wrench in the works. Um, commercial lockdowns in India were significantly more stringent than they were in the US, which really just shut down e-commerce basically, you know, food and medicine, and that was all you could buy for several months. Uh, so launch of the platform was delayed until uh, late 2020, didn't really take off until early 2021. And at that point, it was becoming really clear that sort of an overhaul of the company structure was, was needed. There, were, there was a lot that wasn't working. Um, the company was running out of money. It was really getting, things were getting pretty grim. Um, and so the co-founders who were there at the time, uh, you know, went through a, a complete overhaul, changed everything. And by the middle of the year, it was essentially a new company, massive headcount turnover, massive changes. Uh, at that point, they decided to execute what had always been the long-term plan and move to the US. They did that by enrolling in uh, Techstars Accelerator in LA. And then um, immediately began looking for a US-based co-founder to help lead the expansion in the US. And that was where I came in. So I was an LP with Loyal already at that time. Uh, Loyal was one of Loyal VC was one of the early institutional investors in in Unimart, um, and so Kamal, the GP there, uh, put me in touch with Unimart. He felt that I'd be a good match for what they were looking for. Uh, I had a chat with uh, Shai Masamdar, our CEO. We, we agreed that it looked like a good match. I started working with them informally over the summer last year, and then formally joined in in early October. Um, and given that the company had just redomiciled to the US, it's essentially a totally new initiative out here to just gone through reinvention. In a lot of ways, it feels like joining a, a startup that really is just maybe a year old, you know? Um, so it's been really, really exciting from that point of view. But at the same time, I've got a wealth of resources that you would not typically see at a startup that was actually a year old. So from my point of view, it's, it's really uh, a, an incredible combination of the best of two worlds that I really could not have reasonably expected when I started my, my search for the opportunity. Levi, can you talk some about the challenges or maybe the advantages of having a company in the United States and India? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's huge economic benefits, right? We're, we're able, we have this presence here, so we're able to raise money from, you know, North American and European investors like, like Loyal VC, they're based in Toronto. Um, and we're able to raise that money, you know, at valuations and, and in amounts that is reflective of, you know, US-based startup. At the same time, we've got a fantastic, tech team based in India, um, you know, we pride ourselves on paying well, but it's still India. Cost of living salaries are significantly lower. So that's why we're able to be in a situation where just now, you know, in the middle of, of our seed raise and, and uh, you know, we're, we're still, we've got a team of 90 people sitting in Hyderabad, right? Um, so the huge advantage from that point of view. Um, 
I would also say, you know, it gives us access to multiple different markets, right? We were able to build out this presence. Like I said, we've got a really substantial user base already in India through the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And as a startup, you know, where our focus at every level is international. We have an international team. We're trying to help companies go cross border and sell internationally as profitably, simply and effectively as possible, you know, which is really critical. Um, and so being able to kind of live that at every level of the company and be a truly international company as well, I think it's hugely advantageous, right? Having a presence in the US, for example, means that we can add a lot more value to our sellers in India who want to come to the US. We're way better equipped to help them move here. Um, sellers in the US who want to move to Southeast Asia and India, same deal. Uh, as we grow, we'll set up teams in Latin America, and Europe for exactly the same reason, right? Um, so I think from that perspective, there's, there's a lot of advantage too, right? We, we just have this much bigger footprint and access to resources across both both regions. So Leva, this can be like a multi-part question. Some of this already answered, but like what exactly is it that your company does? Like how it got started, the idea, what you focus on now and what's the vision for the company moving forward? Yeah, that's, that's a great uh Big question. You might need to remind me of the second part. Um, <laughs> so as far as what we're focused on now, um, so like I said earlier, we're, we're an e-commerce enablement platform. So we're working with e-commerce sellers and trying to help them move towards uh, omni-channel retail, right? So branching out into new marketplaces, new channels of sale, um, and at the same time also help them to move cross-border. So we're really trying to catch the wave on two major, major trends. Well, I should say three major trends right now. One, COVID has accelerated a trend that already existed, which is this move to e-commerce. So we're looking at more than half of retail dollars going through e-commerce probably by 2025 or 2026. Um, similarly, within e-commerce, we're seeing a massive shift towards cross-border. So meaning uh, consumer level fulfillment. So we're not talking like full container loads or pallet shipments, but individual packages being shipped across national borders to, to customers. And those might be products that are stored in warehouses in local environments, or they might be stored, they might actually be getting shipped direct to fulfillment or drop shipped to customers internationally. And then the third trend, and, and that again, that's going to be, that's on track now to be uh, cross-border, to be more than half of all e-commerce sales, but in terms of uh, dollars by within the next four years, uh, probably less. Um, and then the third trend is, is omni-channel, uh, omni-channel retail. And this is basically the concept that Increasingly, brands today are selling across many different channels of sales. So they're not just selling through retail or through their own stores. They're also selling through their own websites and they're selling on e-commerce marketplaces. They might be selling through partnerships. In some cases, they might be selling through um, you know, different types of like subscription boxes, things like that. Many, many different patterns. And the, the sort of the gold standard here is to be able to build relationships with your customers that are persistent across those different channels, right? So that you can have you can have the same experience to the for, for any customer regardless of what channel they're interacting with you on right you can you can give a customer a great experience even if they're you know operating if they're purchasing from you or interacting with you through multiple channels and that experience is always going to be consistent and that can be on a technical level in the back end surprisingly difficult to achieve um, and a lot of the problem here is a lot of the different software that's available uh, doesn't play well together you've got a lot of legacy software in the physical retail and you know legacy distribution space and a lot of newer platforms and, and services in the e-commerce you know, marketplace and web store space. And that's ecosystem is changing constantly, right? So what you're seeing with a lot of these brands is what they're having to do is they're, you know, the, the typical path for a US brand is you launch on Amazon first, right? You've got access to a marketplace, Amazon takes care of all your fulfillment, super easy. Then usually right around the same time, you're probably setting up a Shopify store, right? So you have your own store. Um, typical next step is you're probably going to look at starting to sell in Canada. It's international, but it's next door. It's very easy. You can often fulfill directly from the U.S. Depending on your product and where you're at, you might also decide to sell in Mexico. Um, right about at this point, you're probably going to start to feel the constraints of Amazon. Your, your cost of selling is, is going to be quite high. You're realizing that you need to invest pretty heavily in advertising on the platform to be successful. Depending on how big you are, you might be hitting up a, about a million or two in revenue. You're probably starting to feel the pinch from imitators. Uh, and knockoffs, you're having to spend more on advertising to, to deal with that. And if the majority of your sales are coming through Amazon, you're probably now at this point getting worried about losing the buy box, um, about you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, false claims of fraud against your product. This is not an uncommon thing that, that could result in in inaccurate shutdowns of your business for a day or two, which could be catastrophic, right? So you're going, you know what? I don't want all my eggs in one basket. So now you're thinking about expanding internationally. You're probably going to look at the UK first because they speak English. It's a relatively easy market to reach and it's large. And then you're probably looking at Germany after that because that's going to be one of the biggest e-commerce markets in Europe. Um, now at this point, you're going, okay, 
this is getting too complicated. I've got 10 people in my business. We're doing maybe 3 million a year and I'm needing translation. I need to figure out, you know, I'm, I'm moving into the German market. For example, Amazon is nowhere near as big a share of the German commerce market as it is in the US. So you're going, well, if I really want the same kind of market exposure, I need to get on some other platforms. But now that means I'm moving out of the FBA ecosystem. I need to find my own warehousing and logistics solutions. I need to manage those other marketplace stores, which means I need to set up product listings and maintain inventory and ensure that everything is aligned across my different marketplaces and web stores. So I'm looking at hiring a person for each of those new web stores, and I'm probably looking at hiring some kind of a small tech team to figure out how to make all the different systems I need to automate play nice together. So all of a sudden, my costs have started to balloon, the complexity has ballooned, and I don't really have a guarantee of revenue coming in to ensure that I'm going to be profitable in a year or two, right? Not a good situation to be in. So we're trying to do is solve that problem by building this platform to essentially enable that integration all in one place, enable centralized management, and give sellers access to warehousing, logistics, and other ecosystem services that they need in the marketplaces that they're moving to. So sort of like the sort of all-encompassing Amazon experience, but agnostic to the channel that you're on. Um, so that's kind of our near-term goal is landing some, you know, some US customers, supporting their growth, demonstrating that we can replicate the same kinds of results we've seen doubling, tripling revenue within 12 months in, in India that we can do that here as well. Um, and as we start to expand there, then you know, the big focus is gonna be on building our presence out in new countries um, and ideally building some strong partnerships with you know, brand aggregators, marketing agencies, e-commerce agencies who um, you know, will be able to see the value in our platform for their customers and be able to leverage it as a value add to their own services. You know, what's, the, what's the vision for the company moving forward? Like you want to be in every single country or? Yes, ideally, we'd be, we'd be global. So this is an area that's really near and dear to my heart. It's one of the things that Shayak and I, our CEO, originally clicked on when we first talked. Um, you know, we both got strong entrepreneurial bents. We both grew up in, in more rural areas, you know, and, and uh, you know, saw what it was like trying to start a small business and saw the differences in, uh, you know, your, your level of success based on the resources you have access to. So something we believe in really, really strongly is the value of democratizing access to these kinds of resources, right? If we could bring the same level of, of, of access to resources, whether that's money, technical talent, you know, the marketplaces themselves, shipping and logistics services, whatever it is, to someone who wants to be a seller in say, you know, rural Northern India, for example, as someone living in say LA, what kind of landscape change might that make to the, you know, the e-commerce landscape? What kinds of businesses might we start seeing pop up and the levels of success and prosperity in some of those communities that right now don't have access to these kinds of services, right? It's taking advantage of the decentralized nature of modern commerce and ensuring you know, equitable access to that in many, many different areas, right? And this is something that we're very, very excited about. Um, it's, it's really important to, to myself and my co-founder on, on a personal level, you know? So this is this is an area that I'm I, I really believe in and I'm I'm very excited in particular for expansion into Latin America, um, you know, to see what what that kind of brings and you know, because you look at e-commerce initiatives in Latin America, you look at Mercado Libre, for example. I mean, you look at the history of that, they started in 1999 and everybody said this is not a this is not an e-commerce, an e-commerce marketplace coming out of you know Brazil. Like not a thing. And now it's it's a massive company. It's it's I think it's got a $54 billion market cap last mm -hmm. night check, something like that. You know, very successful. What other kinds of success stories are there like that to be unlocked given access to resources? And that, that to me, very exciting. I want to see where we go with that. So Levi, for lack of a better term, a better word, who's your perfect customer? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Okay, so right now, uh, a, a great customer for us would be someone doing, let's say roughly three to 25 million in revenue up to maybe 50 million in revenue. Maybe they've already started dabbling in international you know, exposure on maybe a UK marketplace, German marketplace, something like that. They're getting to the point where they're going, you know, our, our path to growth internationally and, you know, through new marketplaces has been like this, and all of a sudden it's looking like this, right, in terms of cost. And, and they're going, how do we get around this wall? We need to keep growing. Um, they're probably, you know, they're on Amazon, they're on Shopify, they're maybe on one or two other marketplaces. They want to expand to more marketplaces, but they haven't yet because the headcount requirement just is, is becoming, uh, you know, the tech requirement is becoming really difficult. And they're at that point where they're poised to expand. They want to expand, but they need a better way to do it. Um, chances are they're selling something like consumer electronics or fashion products, shoes, jewelry, something like that. Something that's got decent margins, relatively easy to ship, shelf stable, and is probably going to have relatively equal appeal in multiple different marketplaces. 
Um, I'd say that that's that's probably a, a good description at the moment. As we grow, that ideal customer will get bigger and bigger, hopefully. Um, but that's kind of the, the market we're looking at right now. And so what's your method for finding these companies right now? So right now, we're right at the beginning of, of working on this. I mean, part of it is just leveraging our networks, connecting with people. I've been doing a lot of customer discovery, trying to understand, you know, what are the pain points for companies like this? What's the language they're using to describe those? What kind of help are they looking for and how are they looking for it? Um, so that's one aspect, you know, just leveraging networks. Uh, we are spinning up, you know, a pretty traditional, straightforward outbound sales program, uh, which is just now starting to yield some results as well. Um, that's been an interesting experience. My, my background is not in sales, so I've been learning as I go. Uh, one thing I'm very excited about is, is a content program I'm trying to launch here. And I've actually got a couple interviews set up with some really gracious folks who have agreed to talk with me this week. Um, just looking to connect with you know, experts in e-commerce or in spaces that are relevant to an e-commerce seller and just chat with them, learn more about their experience, advice that they can share on a particular topic, and then you know, drafting some blog posts, maybe doing video interviews, something like that out of it, just sharing that with our audience. You know, the idea being not to say, hey, go use Unipart or, you know, as an advertising thing or anything, but really just to start adding value to this community and, you know, starting these kinds of conversations, building some relationships. I mean, what I'd love to see happen at this point, and fingers crossed it will, is that we start connecting with some smaller brands. You know, they're maybe doing a few hundred thousand a year that go, look, you're not right for us right now, but we love your content. We love what you're doing. It's super helpful. And, you know, a year down the road, they go, okay, we're now, you know, we're really successful. We're doing 2 million and now we need an integrated platform and you're the guys we want to work with because we already know you. Right. And that's really what, what I'm hoping to build out here with this content program. And then the last last leg is, is partnerships. We've been having um, just incredibly good results, just connecting with, um, you know, brand aggregators, uh, marketing services, agencies working with startups, um, and, and different types of organizations supporting startups. Like we, we landed, uh, we announced recently a partnership with HSBC Bank because um, they have some programs supporting smaller e-commerce sellers, you know, and lending programs and whatnot. So we're working with them as a value add service that they can then provide to those, those customers to support their growth, right? It's a win-win-win situation for everybody involved. Um, so those kinds of partnerships are super exciting. I'm, I'm really hoping to see a lot more develop in that space as well. Levi, so what percentage of companies in the United States, what percentage is in India, and how you y'all deal with like the, you know, time zone differences and all that, those challenges? You mean percentage of our company? Yeah. Or, uh, so it's, it's like 90% India, 95% India, 5% US at the moment. Um, so there, does the company run off India time or United States time? Oh boy, sometimes it feels like India time. Um, so right now, it depends on what we're doing. If I'm working on a, you know, big marketing, marketing project or something, and I'm leveraging resources in India and working with the team there, we're more or less on India time and I'm pulling some late nights. Um, if I'm doing something more working with like our sales team, you know, that's kind of more locally focused to the US, I get to work more on US time. Um, so it, it really it really depends on the project. I, I anticipate we'll increasingly be moving towards US time as, as the team here is built out. Uh, but, you know, some of our functions are, are as my as, as Shaik likes to say, we have C, uh, uh, global functions like you know, finance, for example, we have a finance team in India, they handle everything for the whole company. And then we have more local functions like sales, right? There's a sales team in India, they're working on the Indian market and surrounding markets. We're building out our sales team now in the US, they'll be focused on the US, right? Um, so, you know, state of flux, really. So Levi, so, you know, you're a startup founder, you do stuff for Founders Institute, you're a VC, angel investor. I'm gonna presume you have some kind of personal life, all this stuff going on. How do you do your schedule day to day? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's basically, I guess there's, there's a few items that, that kind of get penned in and, and they're, they're pretty fixed unless there's something really high priority. So I, uh, I have been trying to play the cello, let's put it that way for several years now. So my cello lessons are one of those things, right? If there's something really important that overlaps, I'll cancel it if I have to or reschedule my lesson, but otherwise that's me time, right? And one of the things I love about working in startup is especially because, you know, we've got hours all over the place, um, I can, uh, you know, my, my cello lesson might be in the middle of the day, which would normally be a work day, but that's fine. I'm working remotely and I'm probably going to be, you know, I got to call it eight, eight, eight o'clock at night with our marketing team anyway. So it, it all kind of balances out. Um, and then there's other stuff that's more sort of on the side, you know, maybe I've got a mentoring call or something that can easily be rescheduled if it needs to. So I, I'd say I really just kind of figure out what, what, what kind of is fixed. Um, next week, for example, I'm starting, uh, I discovered, 
that there's there's an organization here in Seattle that offers uh, blacksmithing classes. That's interesting. Right, that's what I thought. Cool as hell, and honestly, I can't think of anything I'd really that would be a better stress reliever than banging on some metal with a big hammer. So, I've wanted to try blacksmithing since I was like twelve. So I saw that and I said, hell yes, I'm starting that on Monday, for example. That's something that doesn't get rescheduled, so you know I work around it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm I'm at a point now where I'm trying to find a good balance. I've had in previous jobs, I've really thrown myself full full on into the job, and everything else kind of got put off. And I'm at a point now where I thought, you know, it's no longer a sprint. It's a marathon. I want to be in this for the long haul. And that means I need to take care of myself. I need to pursue my interests. And I need to not always be in a state of mind where, you know, I'm saying, well, you know, someday I'll get to that. Later I'll get to that. Right. Uh, and I, I think that's the most important thing. At, at a young age, I was, I was, I don't remember where the book I was reading or something. I was exposed to this idea of, you know, someone being in the mindset that, you know, like a, a, a sort of one day in the future, I'll be able to whatever. And then, you know, this, this character in some novel or something waking up one day going, oh my God, I'm 60. And, you know, I've, just lived my whole career like you know and, and I just thought my god what an awful idea that scared the hell out of me and I just thought I'm, I'm, whatever else happens I'm never going to wake up one day and go oh gosh I've been anticipating and it's already passed me by you know so I always I remind myself it's like a daily mantra this is this is real life I'm in the middle of it I'm living it and it's important to make the most of it you know I say that to mentees all the time especially the ones who are still in college I, go, I bet everybody around you is talking about the real world of real life go, oh yeah they go, they're in the real world this is your real life. It already started. You should be making the most of it right now, right? There's no great inflection point where someone comes to you and goes, behold, you are now an adult. Here's your adult card. You know what I mean? It doesn't happen. You, you, need to, uh, you need to be present in the moment, I guess, for lack of a better word. <laughs> so Levi, how do you take care of yourself? So I think it's a question of prioritization. And I will say, because everything I'm about to say, any like parent is going to just start laughing or maybe crying, right? I am not a parent. I don't have children. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to put up, up front, right? That Because that's that's a whole other set of priorities that, that you have to factor into your life. And I I have great respect for it. I don't understand it. I haven't experienced it myself, and I'm not going to pretend to. So for me personally, um, I'm a competitive power lifter. That's something that's really important to me. Um, so that's a priority, right? I try to get to the gym and lift at least twice a week, um, unless I'm doing other activities that I feel you know swaps in. And then I try to really have a fine-tuned sense of my own sort of capacity and limits, right? And if I'm working throughout the day and I'll get to a point where I go, you know what, I'm tired, I'm not enjoying this, I'm having trouble focusing, and nothing here is an emergency, taking a break. I'm going to go play some video games, take a nap, read a book, whatever I need to do. If it's late in the day, maybe at that point I'm calling it. It's the end of the day. I think it's really just a question of being, for me at least, it's knowing how I like to work, what are my limits, what's my comfort zone, and being very... Um, honest with myself about when it is and is not necessary to exceed my comfort zone, you know, because something's really critical or what have you. So I guess it's, it's really, I don't have a clear answer. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's knowing oneself and having a system of constant check-ins with oneself, I guess is really what it comes down to for me personally. So Levi, back to the mentor you do, and hopefully I answer this, ask this question, right? No, we're talking about no startups, no idea of validation, product market fit MVP. When should a startup switch from that to like growth mode, so to speak? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um, in some sense, never. Because <laughs> I, I think that the one thing that you want to be careful of there is, you know, it's, you really never want to say, okay, customer development is now done. Testing is now done. And now we execute. Yes. In microcosm, right? If you're testing a new marketing strategy, you can say, okay, now we're done with testing this strategy. Let's move forward. But taken as like a holistic statement, no, you should always be engaged in customer development. You should always be talking to your customers, understanding what they want, what they need. And also to people who are not your customers, but could have been, why aren't you our customers, right? And, and understand that. So I think it's really important to always have kind of that process of constant iterative knowledge collecting going on. Um, as far as shifting from growth to scale, you know, I'm a little hesitant to comment on it, to be honest with you, because my... My startup isn't quite there. And my primary exposure here is through FI, which is startups that are very strongly in growth mode. By the time they're getting to scale mode, we I typically don't have a close relationship with them at that point, or at least I haven't yet. None of the startups that I've had a close relationship with have gotten to that point because it's all just been in the past couple of years and it takes longer than that, right? Um, I would say, I guess, some of the things I would look for, maybe if I think more as kind of an investor, is I want to look for some evidence of predictability and repeatability, right? I want to see a startup that can say, if we put this much money into this channel, here is the number of customers we will get. Here's what they'll look like. Here's the revenue we're going to get out of it, right? And when you have kind of that level of 
predictability and insight where you, you where you know what's going to happen when you push certain buttons and pull certain level levers that's typically a really good sign obviously it's assuming that you've established product market fit and so it's it's really a question i use this metaphor not a lot but i think it's a question of having a decent sense that you have built a machine you know how it works you know that it will work and now you need to think about what kind of fuel you're going to put in it right when you're at that early stage of a startup you're still building the machine you're trying to figure out if this engine is going to work with the machine if it's even going to run and where the heck the engine goes in the first place, right? Um, so th th that's kind of broadly how I think about it. I'm dodging your question a little bit just because, to be honest with you, I, I don't, I don't think I have the level of expertise to answer that intelligently. <laughs> no worries. So Levi, is there anything I sort of asked you that I didn't ask you, or anything else you want to talk about? Gosh, no. I think it's been a really enjoyable conversation. Nothing really jumps to mind, but thanks a lot, Jason. Cool. It's been fun. So Levi, I, I forgot to ask you this during the pre-talk, but is there any like? gift or resource you want to give away some people do some people don't oh like, oh from our business well yeah. you know i will say right now we are looking for um us based you know e-commerce startups to be interested in working with us and participating in a case study um you know, nothing complex right just where we follow them along for a few months and say well, where they start where they end up and uh you know be more than happy to extend some generous discounts if that all right i'll get more details from you from the show notes yeah i'd be more than happy to um and we're also putting together some other kind of promotional packages there. Um, so, you know, happy to share more, more there, but you know, if, if someone is curious about Unimark, curious about what we're doing and might be interested in kind of doing a pilot test or creating a case study, I would love to have a conversation and we can definitely look at something. And can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, websites, unimark.com is E U N I M A R T. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn as well. I apologize. I don't have the URL off the top of my head, but, um, you can definitely find it with a quick search or I'm on LinkedIn. It's linkedin.com slash IN slash Levi lead. Um, definitely happy to connect with folks. Just ask them to leave a little note. So I know it's not spam. And uh, of course you can link to you Mark from my page as well from there. Uh, we've got an Instagram account as well and some other stuff, but I'd say LinkedIn is probably the place to go if you're, if you're looking LinkedIn or our website, if you're looking for more information. And so listen, we'll have the link to his, to his gift in a, in a social media on the show notes. Find us on notes at www.kevinshrblog.com. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe to this episode and share with your friends. So we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom about anything you want to talk about? Quick 30 second minute clip. <laughs> oh, no pressure. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, I, I, I think I'd probably just reiterate what I said before. You know, it's, it's, I think it's really important to uh, recognize your priorities, recognize your your limits. Um, I think it's it's important to think about limits. Limits are are real and they exist, but they're also typically malleable, right? And uh, you know, as you're growing as a professional, if you're thinking about going into startups, I think it's 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 always an exciting experience to find your limits and test them, and then figure out a plan to expand, you know, your capacity in certain areas if you want to. Uh, I think it's a question of balancing reality with pragmatism with optimism, right? Um, I'd say that's something that's pretty top of mind for me lately as I'm, I'm finding I'm testing my own limits and capacities, you know, in this new experience. Levi, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jason. It's been a pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.